OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Alright, it's Thursday morning, it's the 15th of June, you're very welcome along to OTBAM. Uh, we've got a very busy program for you, we're going to be here all the way until 10 o'clock and we're uh, covering pretty much everything that there is that's moving at the moment in the world of sport. And uh, it's one of those down days where everybody's waiting for something to start, like the US Open or the football tomorrow night. How's everybody feeling about the football? Uh, you know, as the game approaches, suddenly the magnitude of it becomes closer and closer. Shane, good morning to you, how are you? Good morning, how's all? Uh, so the Dutch were beaten last night in extra time by Croatia. Um, Croatia still doing Croatia things, mm. and so they're through to the final of the Nations League. Is that what, is that what it's called? The Nations League, yes. Yeah, yeah. that's the one. Uh, Italy plays Spain tonight in the second semi. Mm-hmm. Game went extra time last night. Luka Modric still going strong ah. in extra time. Ridiculous. This, this fella's a good player, it turns out. Unbelievable, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. My dad was in um, Dubrovnik and Montenegro last week with his siblings for a little trip and nice. came back and he had a brilliant, it's, it's a fake, it's, it's not an original jersey, but a very good replica, Croatia jersey, the red and white with Modric 10 in the back for me. It's a beautiful piece of kit. It's fantastic. I've, I've fallen in love with it straight away and Modric is one of those players I've always admired and loved, so I'm going to get some use out of it. Possibly festival use as well. Oh yeah, oh, that's perfect. Like, oh yeah, wear there a bucket go. bucket hat and a Croatia top. Yeah, where you go. It's lucky you're already in a relationship now, Shane. It's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorted. That's breaking news for the airwaves. There, there you go. Sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. well, you, you put it on Instagram. It's public now. True. Yeah. Sorry to let everyone down. Um, oh, was I not supposed to? No, no, no. Of course, no, no. Absolutely, it's it's out there in the ether. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a relationship too, Jared. It's okay. Fair enough. Yeah, fair yeah, enough. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty. If anybody wants to get in touch with us on WhatsApp, you can also uh, leave a comment. YouTube.com forward slash off the ball. Um, the thing I was just chatting to Phil outside, and he was like, "The Dutch weren't that good last night." So mm. that, that actually adds an extra layer of frisson to this game. Like it's possible they just pie off this campaign, and it doesn't make a blind bit of difference to them. Mm. Do they have they already qualified for the Euros as a result of reaching the semi-finals last night? Is that is that does that have an impact on? I don't I don't know. We need to call Kevin Caban for the permutations. Exactly. Here. Yeah, but like I, I, there's a gazillion ways for everybody still to qualify, right? So they might not be that into this campaign. Yeah. Um, and they might just like. Uh, so that I guess basically there's a world in which the winner of Ireland Greece who gets the most points finishes scrapes into a second place mm-hmm. through the back door which would be huge obviously Greece I, Greece are already qualified or at least have reached a playoff what? yeah they've reached a playoff okay. um, so yeah I love the way we're trying to rationalise it by saying oh the Dutch and the Greeks don't care about playing us it's fine uh, we, we need some results from it like it doesn't feel like the kind of group where both Ireland and Greece lose both games to the Dutch and lose both games to the French and then they're relying on who beats the like the likes of Gibraltar by more I feel like there are, there are going to be one or two results against the Dutch or the French yeah, I, that are uh, unexpected you can see the French dropping points right mm. now will it come in September against us I mean maybe or will it come in Athens you know they could easily again phone one in and as the campaign wears on and they they are already qualified there's a game at the end where they're like ah this doesn't matter we mm. play our B team um, I, you know. I'd like to think that I, I found it fascinating and I only heard about it this morning the, the goals that Stephen Kenny has been showing to the, t- to the team I mean it's the, the, the pick of goals is about as random as you can possibly imagine it's pretty small it's a pretty small pick of goal so uh, for anybody who's wondering what we're talking about there's um, I, I think this is standard fair so everyone's like Whoa, what's going on here yeah. um, a motivational video a tiny part of the uh, two weeks of preparation that they've had so it was, well, it's even longer now at this stage There was how long was Bristol was it five days in Bristol four days in Bristol and okay, then so a week and for, ten, for ten days in yeah. um, uh, 10 days in, in Turkey so that's two weeks together um, with a, a break in between mm. um, the, the, the there was a video shown at some point which was our away winners um, over the years uh, big away wins do you have the list? I have the list. So Mark Lawrence's goal in Scotland. That's, that's a big game. In fairness, like that was a Scotland team who, you know, back when Scotland were a really good team. <laughs> now some of the some of the teams in this list aren't quite as as good. Uh, John Aldridge against Malta in 1990. You've got Staunton and Cascarino against Albania in 94. Uh, Gary Kelly's goal against the Cypriots in 02. 
some people might, might remember that one uh, Keith Fahey against Armenia in 2012 which we had to look up this morning just to jog the memory it was a lovely little finish at the bottom left corner yeah. ball falls to him nicely from a uh, Robbie Keane causing disruption and uh, Aidan McGeady against Georgia 2016 so yeah away, away winners from players that uh, and I think this is the point that Kenny was trying to make you know it might be your first goal for your country tomorrow night but it could be huge um, and, and it will mean so much to score to score a late winner like to get the three points the difference in three points and, and a point tomorrow night yeah although look uh, again I, I see you and Vinny talking about a win I would take a good performance and a draw and a goal like I'd be mm. happy with us having a, a good performance and a draw and a goal away from home and then beating Gibraltar soundly and then going into September with a large ho- hopefully our full pick of available players and um and progress like yeah. this is the bit where we've got to see some progress because he's had the group for such a period of time and sure there are some injuries but um, you know like the difference between having Coleman and not having Coleman is, is really important in terms of leadership mm. like uh, somebody else was talking about the age group of the strikers Dan was talking about it last night with Joe and in the papers today somebody else is writing about the fact that we have uh, Ferguson Obafemi Paris and um, Mikey Johnson is the the senior member of the forwards at 24. <laughs> it's uh, 24, 22, 21, 18. Um, and Dan was comparing them to the Euro 2016 group where it was Robbie at 35, Darren Murphy at 32 or 33. Um, Walters was he in it as Walters, well? Walters, um, Kevin Sam, Doyle yeah, and Shane yeah. Long. And Shane Long was the baby of the group at that stage. <laughs> Uh, and who had already you know had however many caps he had by that stage probably the, the vast majority of his entire one so yeah really young team and uh, hopefully this bit where they've embedded the game plan and explained exactly what everybody is expected to do has been an opportunity for them all to get together come together and understand that and now this is the bit where they begin to show what they're capable of and if that results in a draw I'd be happy enough at this stage um, and hope that they can get something off the Dutch in the two games. Mm. Like that's the bit where if you could if you can win one of those two games against the Dutch, that's a transformative moment. But if they lose this game, you know, if they lose this game, then all of a sudden the knives are out, and yeah. and it's just difficult because there's you know there's no rationale for us not to perform as well as uh, this is as good as we're going to get without the the boost of the confidence of winning yeah like it, it's it's not going to be a 2002 campaign where you finish ahead of one of the Portuguese or the Dutch with, with good performances like we're not going to we're not going to finish ahead of either of those teams um, but having said that you can get a result against the Dutch uh, that could help you very much finish ahead of Greece which is the most important thing uh, and get that third spot at least in the group um, like Stephen Kenny seems confident I know he has to seem confident, but the, even the age group of the of the forwards that doesn't that doesn't concern me, doesn't worry me. If anything, as you say, compared to twenty sixteen, it's a positive thing. Like if we were running around still with mid thirty year old strikers, that would be a concern. Um, it's really about game time, isn't it? Evan Ferguson at least is playing proper Premier League football. Some of the rest of them aren't really playing week in week out, but nobody's played for the last six seven weeks, so it's kind of left the playing field a little bit. Uh, the Greek home form is what really worries me Greece are pretty good it turns out yeah it turns out they're a good team Um, and and people might not be familiar with many of their their squad players but it's one of those things where they just work together well Uh, Gus Poyet has them playing a particular brand of football similar enough brand of football to to Stephen Kenny you would say definitely possession based especially at home Um, like they've got the likes of Simicas in there and players that you might recognise but I, I think I really think we need to be targeting a win in this one I, I don't share the same um, outlook on a draw I get it like if we perform if we if we play really really well and get a one all draw or whatever a two all draw um, you would take it of course but but I, I think we're going to look back at the end of this group and say well, Jesus there was a win there for us in Greece like the fourth seed in the group Greece I, 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 I know I'm talking myself into a win here but I think we're going to need one by the end of the group uh, uh, yeah we are we are definitely going to need a win along the way well, well uh, this game in particular I think well you know? I, I think four points against Greece over the two games would be amazing That like we would absolutely mm. 
uh, bite your hand off for that at this stage uh, if that was going to be possible so um, we shall see some of the other news headlines like this I definitely did not believe that this was going to happen but it looks like it's very very close to happening if it doesn't happen at this point there will be egg on the face of Celtic because the, the, the briefing that's been going on from clearly both sides is that a deal is very close to being done between uh, Dermot Desmond and Brendan Rodgers and so that's obviously his unveiling in 2016 uh, the world is a slightly different place now but Brendan Rodgers is um, convinced that he wants to go back and conquer European football at Celtic fair play for both of them really mm. for like deciding that this is the right thing for us assuming it works because generally you don't go back in football not a huge number of examples of people who have successfully gone back somewhere mm. is Carlo Ancelotti the best example he's been to Real Madrid twice yeah yeah it, like it can work in rare examples uh, oh they know he knows the club like turning down leads in the process it seems as well does that mean Celtic are a bigger club than Leeds United We've had this discussion on air one day, Lashing O'Reilly, of course. A keen, fervent Celtic supporter and uh, Cameron, our own Leeds man. Went to blows, almost, Jared has to be said, over who's the bigger club. You, you're, you're talking fan base, you're talking stadium, you're talking interest um, and dominance in Europe. Uh, it's, 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 a le- it's a level one, but I'm interested to see what people think. But my point is, Brendan Rodgers has decided Celtic are a bigger club than Leeds. Maybe he's just sick of the Premier League. Like he's had his he's had his time with Leicester there the last couple of years, and probably wants to get back up to somewhere where he's well thought of. Is that a stretch now? It's I helping? think he was beloved until he walked away, yeah. and that was seen as an act of treachery by many Celtic fans who were like, "No, you can't go and take a smaller club in their eyes." Mm. In uh, now, he nearly turned them into. Uh, Champions League team which was a, would have been uh, one of the all time great managerial achievements like obviously Ranieri winning the league is kind of a unicorn event but the fact that Rodgers got them to within a match two seasons in a row of the Champions League if they could just have got over the line mm. in either of those and look in one of those seasons he prioritised winning the FA Cup and they did that and they had that trophy so like it, it's all time great period in uh, Leicester City's life now he does bear some responsibility for the fact that the team won't be playing the Premier League next season even though he didn't take them down maybe he would have got them out of it who knows mm. uh, but that that's the hy- hypothetical situation I, I think Brendan Rodgers is a good manager and I know people don't like him because he has self-confidence um, uh, but his teams play good football like his teams do play good football they're, they're good to watch mm. um, turns out he's a very good manager uh, I think that like if there was an Ireland job in the future I you know his son was capped underage by the Republic of Ireland there's no reason not to think that now at some point in the future I'm saying Mm -hmm. we obviously wouldn't be able to afford him now and he's just gone to Celtic and so that's obviously where he's going to be for the long term you'd have to assume that John O'Shea is is the um, most likely succession candidate and that Lee Carsley now is obviously coming into sharp relief if he doesn't get the mm. senior England gig which doesn't seem to be on his radar we'll see how well he, he does in the under 21 euros is it under 20 or under 21 euros whatever I, I, I mistake the uh, underage 21s uh, I think it, it is, changes yeah. so much yeah it's like a, it's we, we changed in GAA to under 20s of course we did but did they not change no they didn't anyway um so I don't know I think Brendan Rodgers as a future Ireland's manager I, he, I can get behind this he's in the tier though of, of club managers that are probably slightly too good to be considered for the Irish job do you know the, the managers that you're like well I'm they, saying at the can, moment yeah I would the next 10, 15, 20 years Rodgers can get a pretty decent club job 20 years is a long time in football true yeah but like he, he he's consistent and like everywhere he has gone so far he has done good things if he can keep that going if his, if his love for the game I'm not saying he's going to be a Roy Hodgson in terms of longevity but he'll be around for a while yeah, maybe managers get to the point where they, they reach a certain age and they're like international football yeah that's for me pick up your X amount of money per year only have to enter when the international camps come around you can go around to the club matches and watch them and act like you're watching your own players but really you're just watching football um, yeah maybe Brendan Rodgers speaking about the Irish character would be be something to to look forward to are you on the anti-Brendan Rodgers train anti-Brendan Rodgers no no I don't think so and and certainly chatting to a lot of my Celtic fan mates in Monaghan they were keen on Rodgers and and I I was surprised at that at first because I was like well 
remember how it ended the last time um, but no straight away when Ange Postacoglu's uh, departure to Spurs became a reality they were like no Brendan Rodgers bring him back he's the obvious candidate if it doesn't happen now as you say they'll be they'll be a, a joke shop and I don't know who We'll come in after that, but it seems it seems relatively close. It's obviously on the back page of this morning. So the other back page that I just want to talk about briefly here is the on the mirror. Gunners have Kai hopes, ambitious boss Arteta is ready to move for Chelsea striker Havertz, but wants to cut back on seventy million price tag for Champions League winner. <laughs> seventy million. Is this a is this a is Kai, Kai Havertz the missing piece of the jigsaw for that team? A flaky striker. Is that what is that what they need? I mean. Now, the chances to goals ratio for Kai Havertz it's not really what they need it seems to me yeah, but has he just been flaky and a Chelsea team that has A too many players and B too, mo- too many management changes in the last few years like maybe the solidity of still living in London but moving to a team with Mikel Arteta in charge is exactly what he needs sometimes it's just a small change the colour in jersey um, that can change a player's mentality Havertz is a brilliant footballer there's no doubt about that Um what does he bring to Arsenal? I don't know. Like seventy million. There's a there's an opportunity cost when you sign players at seventy million though, because there's other players that you could get for that. Yeah. And it seems to me that shopping at Chelsea and Manchester City is generally expensive. They'll say last season worked out with uh, Jesus and Zinchenko, and I, I do think it's a little bit early for us to just say that that was guaranteed to be a hundred percent success. Let, let's see what happens over the rest of the next eighteen months. Say. Mm. Uh, so far, I'd say. On balance, good, uh, but not as amazing as everybody is. Like, oh look, they transformed the culture of the team. It's like, yeah, okay, but like, actually, a good centre back, uh, improvement in midfield play, and one of the best attacking young footballers in the world would actually, I would argue, was more important. And there was no significant diminution in the quality of the team when Jesus went out. But that's why spending sixty million on Havertz mm. seems high for somebody who has done okay in the Premier League. You know, it's not like he has absolutely torched teams on a consistent basis, week in, week out. No. He's been good in Europe when he's got the opportunity to be good in Europe. Um, I just think it's been such a mess at Chelsea in the last couple of years that you have to give any player there a little bit of leeway to some degree I feel like every single transfer is between Chelsea and Arsenal by the way like how many times are players either linked or or sent between the two uh, and there was the whole Mudrick saga of course last year like it just seems to happen quite consistently Havertz is probably a, like is Havertz a better signing than Mason Mount from Manchester United I don't know I, I'm I'm out on both of these can I can I say no to both of them is it no? okay if I'm like I'm going to save my 120 million combined and go and sign some players like I might just hire Brighton's chief scout and see who's yeah. on their list of players and spend my 120 million on all of the players that they were going to buy and put them out on loan for a couple of years and then I'll have like five players who are brilliant uh, Havertz goals in the league mm. uh, for Bayer Leverkusen from 2016-2017 on so Leverkusen four goals in 24 games three goals in 30 games 17 goals in 34 games and then 12 goals in 30 games before he moves to Chelsea and it's four goals in 27 games eight goals in 29 games and seven goals in 35 games what are you spending 60 70 million on this for yeah but isn't that what isn't that what a footballer is, is worth nowadays who does exactly those numbers you've seven goals a season eight goals a season four I know. goals a season it's, rid- it's ridiculous but like I'm fairly sure this might just be I don't know if it's sorry I, I, this is on understat.com I was looking for the XG and the XG is like nearly double that mm. he's, he's underperforming his XG at the moment like last season chronically yeah you'd wonder like does the likes of um, Pochettino know know something we don't? Well, he's getting rid of him. Yeah, he's getting rid of him. Does he know something we don't, or is he just looking at the stats and going, "This is shy." What am I doing? Is no, go, you go, you go, you go, you go out. It can come back to bite you though, selling to to teams in the Premier League. Like it, it can. Well, I mean, like you look at the Bruyne and Salah. Obviously, that's two of the worst transfer decisions that were ever made. Getting rid of them. Mm. Um, so look it can come back to bite you but I think if you're getting 50, 60, 70 million for those Chelsea are absolutely delighted yeah you're going to take it well, they, they outright rejected 40 million for, for Mason Mount yesterday straight away the first bid from, from Old Trafford um, I don't do they want they probably want twice that amount but United are obviously starting in a place where they think Mason Mount is worth um, it could be one of those transfer sagas that goes and United eventually don't pay what they want Um like Manchester United in a transfer saga mm, I know that starts at the start of the season and doesn't finish until the last day of the transfer window 
and then the player is completely discombobulated for the first six months. We don't really see the best of them for maybe the first full season. No, that's not going to happen to Manchester United, is it? They're such a well-run club, Shane. <laughs> I'm still uh, they're not by the way uh, whatsoever a well-run club um, but I'm still traumatised as a kid by Classian Huntelaar he was one he was like one of my favourite players as a kid and I remember the, the transfer saga rumbling on through the summer and I, I just I would nearly already bought the jersey the uh, you know taking out the mortgage to buy a Classian Huntelaar jersey because every letter costs a little bit extra Um so yeah, those those sagas tended to rumble on when you were a United fan as a kid. Yeah, they were just the league match fixtures for that I was giving you for Havertz. There, he did play ten games in the Champions League last season and scored two goals, so that would improve things slightly. But uh, seven goals and one assist in thirty-five Premier League appearances. No, not having a pal. Mm. You're, yeah, but you're, you're running off just stats there, Chair. What about the? The impact he has on a game. What yeah. about man of the match performances? What about involvements in goals? Do you know? I don't know. You got to look at the, the big picture here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stats man yeah. over there. Havertz. I just um, I, like he's a good player, and I, I'm sure with a good manager he could be a functional member of a team. And you know, if he's gone to Arsenal, he's not going to be uh, required to do stuff week in week out. He'll come into the team instead, or as well as Martinelli and Jesus, and they'll be able to change their, their formation. And maybe that's what they need for an assault in the Champions League. They're going to play slightly different away from home or something. I don't. I, you know, obviously a lot goes into a decision mm. to try and sign a player like that, or else this is Chelsea trying to drum up some sense that actually, you know, what, we need to get rid of Havertz here, and we need to get rid of. There was um, there was one deal Chelsea were linked with. It might be the Onana deal or it's somebody else, maybe it's a midfielder, where they were like, oh, we'll give you money and you can have your pick of one of these five players as well. Mm. And I guess they're hoping that Inter are like, oh, we'll take all five of them, no problems. Yeah. Uh, it's so. not a great look, isn't it, when you're offering up to five players? You're screwed. Yeah. You are absolutely screwed. Um, but I, again, I think Pochettino can turn that around because he can just pick a squad of 18 and that's the squad week in, week out, and they can play every single game give or take because there's no distractions there's no other tournament or competition for them to play in so he's got his hands full Pochettino let me tell you um, yeah almost almost of sympathy for Frank Lampard if I have to deal with that, that dressing room no uh, no maybe not quite and then the other one is uh, the other big story from overnight loyalty bonus Saudi's planning to pay McElroy for staying put this was he was he was asked you know in the press conference last week and we haven't seen him do a similar one just yet I suspect because something is happening in the background um, this story is, is all over the English papers this morning PGA Tour players including Rory McElroy and Tiger Woods who stayed loyal and turned down lucrative offers from Liv are set to be rewarded by the very same people who tried to lure them away according to reports so basically uh, they are not going to be sacrificial lambs they are not going to be uh, punished for staying the prodigal son is not the only one getting the fatted calf slaughtered there will be many cows slaughtered for Roy McElroy and for Tiger Woods and for anybody else at that level John Ram so you could see the anger that John Ram had it was like well uh, excuse me what <laughs> excuse me they're all just going to Swan back in next year and play and we're there looking like chumps so there's a reason that McElroy wasn't maybe as displeased or as angry as we've seen him in that recent press conference oh I thought I thought uh, he was, but, there was an undercurrent of course but by that stage there was like he, he was asked he, 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 I can't remember the exact phraseology but in in um, in, uh, in the mafia movies they talk, talk about being made whole you know, you gotta you gotta make him whole. You kill the wrong guy, you gotta make him whole. How much is it? Oh, it's fifty grand. It's a hundred grand. It's two hundred fifty grand. It's a hundred million. It's two hundred fifty million. It doesn't matter. The telephone numbers. What did Phil get? That's what I want. Yeah. That what did Phil get? I want what Phil got at least. I want what Phil got plus a dollar. Yeah, but there was a little bit of omerta about him as well, wasn't there? Sticking with the mafia theme, he was kind of, he was a little bit quiet, tender, um, shook. You might say in that yeah, press conference. Yeah, I think that like he 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 did the right thing and was proven to uh, you know only the only the stupid do the right thing. That's what that's the lesson is, kids. Follow the money in sport, anyway. Yeah, uh, it's depressing. Um, it, it's going to be the dark shadow over the the Los Angeles Country Club in uh, in the U.S. Open from today but once the action starts I don't think anyone cares but there's still going to be that little divide everyone, people not wanting the live players to, to win these tournaments but that's going to disappear within I'd say after this tournament I think like, it's gone I yeah. think it's gone I think golf fans are like yeah the best golfers are going to play against each other 
mm. on the whole it, it's similar to the, my um, my whatsapp groups at the moment with the Qataris like I, I've, I have a lot of United friends who are now leaning heavily towards Qatar and I'm like it's it's turned from 50-50 to let's give the Qataris and I, I think it's probably when you're seeing players like Mbappe and Neymar as possible signings people are like oh yeah let's bring them in let's take the money so yeah it's depressing how, how sport is headed that direction and people just learn to live Stockholm Syndrome which is not great is it um, I mean there's part of me that really wants to see what would happen with the new banter era when the owners are in signing players Ten Hag is going to last six months eight months if that happens well, it, and they start going you can have this player and this player and this player and this player and I want to see them play every game and he's like no it's like yeah that's how it works here because it's my team I get to pick the team I want to I want a phone on the bench so I can ring you in the middle of the game it's like oh, yeah yeah no 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 uh, put Neymar on why, why is Neymar not playing well the Saudis haven't done that in Newcastle no but uh, uh, what, what's the experience of PSG yeah Sheikh Yassim is not you know he has been involved with the team before all the more is it Tal Bowley hadn't been involved with the team before true like, not, a, not a soccer team you see that's why Jim Ratcliffe is probably the safer option in, in that sense in terms of ownership he'll kind of sit back and let the team be, be the team yeah the billionaires are notorious for like just letting everybody get, get on with their business aren't they yeah but like you, do you not trust a man you put your man in charge so if you trust Ten Hag you keep him in charge if he doesn't trust him after a year so get rid of him bring someone else in don't tell the manager what to do decide who the manager is yeah of course use your billions to, to pick the manager of a massive football club but uh, you, you can't you can't use your billions to be a top bowler, can you I mean these lads are just playing, playing billionaires monopoly like. yeah and I think the rest of the world would be pretty interested in seeing what would happen at uh, Manchester United if that was to become the case like if, if the new managers or new owners come in and decide that they've got a world class manager and they're going to back him in the transfer window then Manchester United are going to be contenders for the next couple of seasons but if they come in and decide that they want superstar fancy players who will come to the the super yacht for the weekend then who knows what's going to happen the only argument uh, in my head for it, for the Qataris taking over Old Trafford is they're coming in. They're coming into the sport. Saudis, Qataris, they're pumping their money. It's kind of like, just let them dope every cyclist in the Tour de France. Let, let the 100 metres in the Olympics be entirely doped. Let them run in seven seconds. And let's see how fast the human, the human being can actually physically go. It's going to get to that point in the Premier League where you're, you're going to have seven, eight, nine clubs who are so unbelievably pumped full of money that it's just a, a battle between them to see I mean if you have United with loads of money Liverpool with loads of money Chelsea with loads of money battling with Man City it's going to be pretty interesting to watch it's not going to be great for the for the bottom half in the Premier League which will actively change uh, as teams get relegated and come back up because the divide is just going to go insanely big between between the top seven or eight and the rest so yeah football in the next ten years is going to change dramatically I think alright what do you all think of uh, Shane's view of the mutant world that we may be heading towards uh, give us your thoughts this morning 87 180 that's the whatsapp number you can get us at off the ball am on twitter or you can leave a comment on youtube.com forward slash off the ball it is time for the cash machine off the balls summer cash machine Okay, roll over, baby. After Joe became our latest winner on Tuesday, somebody missed the opportunity to win the cash machine on Wednesday afternoon. That means we have a rollover. There's a potentially life-changing amount of cash up for grabs. If you've entered since 5 o'clock on Tuesday, you're still in to win, but you must know the new cash machine amount. So take part easy every day. Around about this time on OTB AM, we give you an amount. You take note of it, you enter, and if it's you, we call at 3 o'clock. You tell us the amount, and you join 63 other people as cash machine winners this year. The summer cash machine has been reloaded. It's 41,661 euro and 43 cents. 41,661 euro and 43 cents. To enter, text OTB and just just the letters OTB to 57557. If it's you, we call back after 3 o'clock on Thursday, the, the 15th of June. Answer your phone within five rings and tell us the prize amount and you'll win the money. Text OTB to 57557. The cost is 250 plus your standard message rate to play. You've got to be over 18. You're playing across the Go Loud network of stations. And full terms are on our website at offtheball.com. Get your entry in by 3 o'clock on Thursday, June 15th. The cash machine will then randomly pick one entry and it could be you that we're calling. So that number again is €41,661.43. We're back after these with Keith Wood. Off the Balls, Summer Cash Machine. 
Off the Ball Daily. A home for your favourite podcasts from Off the Ball. The performance rankings, you had to be there, the crappy quiz, and a slight tangent. They're saying it to each other. Yeah. That's what they're saying about us. It's just like one of those things you say in a dress group. They're all saying we're this. I'm just like, <laughs> Jesus, are they? Subscribe to the Off the Ball Daily podcast feed right now. I have sort of a bit of a mad anecdote just to paint a picture for the kind of guy that he was. I remember in one particular trip, we were going out, flying out to Japan, and uh, I'd be in business class and he'd be in first class, and there'd be a difference of maybe 10,000 pounds in the ticket in those days. So I, I would wonder what was up in first class. And so, so Evan came down and we were chatting away, and I mentioned to him about a race that he lost. Very, very ordinary race in Formula Four 2000 in Brands Hatch, where a British driver called Calvin Fish beat him. And I brought this up in conversation. This was early in a 12 hour flight. You cannot believe this, Shane, but for 12 hours, he told me why he lost that race. <laughs> Tire pressures to the valves and springs to, and he went on. And I, and I left the seat to go to the bathroom and think, hope he's gone when I go back. And I came back and he was still there to tell me passionately. And if I could have opened up that window at 32,000 feet uh, at 600 miles an hour, I would have climbed out onto the wing. Just <laughs> He was absolutely bordering, I'm not going to say maniacal, but a religious fever. And he wouldn't let go. And I said, I was just a bad day. Oh, God, it wasn't just a bad day. It was the end of his world. And he continued telling me about the nuances. Uh, it was quite striking. Uh, and this was the intensity that he had about what he did. Uh, certainly, look, I think the world came to a stop in terms of motorsport when he died and, and, and all the conspiracy theories about that. It was a mechanical failure, clearly. That corner's taken flat out and the steering failed. And you can see the correction he tried to make. And, and as a driver, you know, instantly what it is. Your brakes are failed, your steering is gone. Uh, uh, and, and you'll employ sort of a, a preconditioned reaction. And, and that was such a tragedy uh, in how we died. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. It's uh, two minutes past eight this morning. You were listening there in the ad break to Shane, chatting to former Formula One driver David Kennedy, where he recalled a remarkable story about Ayrton Senna. The F1 pod on OTB is brought to you by Chicago Town Pizza. Real takeout taste for less with Chicago Town. Now, I'm delighted to say Keith Wood is with us. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? I'm very good, sir. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Um, we, there's a couple of big stories that we should uh, talk about. Um, finally, the entire country is united behind Ron Nogara and La Rochelle this weekend because if La Rochelle beats Toulouse in the final, then uh, Munster fans will be happy because it's one of their own doing really well. And Leinster fans are going to be happy as well because in the newly fixed or nearly fixed uh, European Champions Cup, Leinster are back into top seeds as a uh, result of um, being beaten by La Rochelle. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the actual new pool system, but we're getting back to something slightly better if it's not still quite fixed. No, no, I, I was, I, I will admit, I kind of really lost the will to go on um, when I was trying to read it. Uh, competition should be very simple. Um, but th- none of this is simple. There's um, different teams can't be in different groups. Different teams don't play against different groups. Um, it's trying to find a mix that suits everybody, and it's a compromise that I think is a, just a little bit frustrating still. I mean, ever since they've tinkered with it. And it wasn't perfect before, and I know we often think it was. It was absolutely beneficial to the Irish teams the way it was before. Um um, partly because the Irish teams were always guaranteed to be in it and um, um, uh, by playing in it every single year you get used to it and you understand it a bit more and um, it was different then on, in almost a pure meritocracy for the other teams but now there's so many teams that are in it um, it is chopping and changing consistently um, they haven't it right, I think, but I, I think they need to get it right over the next couple of years just to try and have it where it it is seamless. Now, and the reason I say that previously it wasn't right, there were a few dead robbers and there was a few French teams who didn't take the games seriously enough. 
Um, but in the last year, teams didn't take uh, some of the matches seriously enough because they didn't have to. They only they could have qualified by winning one match, pretty much. So I think this looks a little bit better, um, but it's a work in progress. It's definitely a work in progress. Is it going to be a seeding system on the basis of different teams playing each other and results? And it's kind of difficult to see exactly how that's going to end up working out. Whereas previously, you had uh, two teams coming out of groups. Now, the issue there was that if you got drawn with one of the Italian sides it was a routine five points and that ended up skewing who got home advantage the Italian teams aren't automatically qualifying anymore and it did like the main problem is that they've taken out a couple of rounds and rugby is the only sport where the European competition is getting fewer games than the domestic competition it does feel as if they still kind of quite haven't worked out the whole economics of if we play more big games we'll get more people to come to them and we should be generating more revenue off the back of that well, look, when we start talking revenue, which I think we're going to discuss a few other parts, uh, for for the Premiership and for, um, for the French Championship, they don't get paid as much money for European. It isn't, it isn't as valuable for them. And uh, for the elements of this that are a business, there's a, a large requirement for that to be the case. Um, but I think... I think it's all going to change within England anyway, with the English Premiership going to be down to 10 teams. Um, should they automatically get the same number of teams into into the competition? That doesn't seem right either, because it's supposed to be meritocracy, but it's the top eight. Um, so that's top eight out of 10 seems a little bit uh, top heavy. Um, look, I, I just think it's, I think this year, I think the World Cup will take over a huge amount of concentration um, and I think there'll be an awful lot of back-channeling conversations to try and figure out where rugby can go at the present moment in time. And at times we seem, it's funny, I've looked at a couple of the, the notice boards and this uh, people seem to be saying, well, look, Ireland's in great shape and um, almost glorying in the fact that other teams are going or it's not as, as good in England or elements of, of that. We need all the countries to be strong. We need all the teams to be strong for it to be a viable, sustainable um, series of competitions. So um, rugby has to have some level of a reset. And we discussed this at, at, at lockdown um, when we'd, we were trying to figure out what we were, what we were supposed to talk about and that the idea was there for a reset. But what has happened since is it's become... Um, more financially skewed, more financially strained. Um, and I, th I think we're in a kind of strange period of time for the next couple of years. So, look, I love the European competition. The Irish teams have embraced it more than anyone. Some of the French teams have, some of the English teams have. Um, there is there is a financial model. There has to be through Europe and with Europe. It is... Um, we know it from the crowds that turn up for those matches. We know it for the rivalries that have have gone gone over the history. Like we talked about Ron Nagar at the start, you know he was Mister European Cup. He still is, and it, it was built on huge series of different rivalries with Munster and Gloucester, with Munster and Leinster. You know, with with Toulouse, with with Leinster and everybody with Toulon. You know, there was huge huge competition huge rivalries that were built up that get 30 40 50 thousand people through the gate and that's what's required it like it, the money is obviously the huge thing here keith and, and certainly when you come to the champions cup structures that's one of the rationales behind it and tv viewers viewership obviously matters as well but jeopardy is, is what sport is all about and you look at this new structure and you're thinking well if you win a couple of your games two of your games you get into the round of 16 basically mismatched opponents at that stage like I know the, the rugby purist loves the, the old Heineken Cup model um, like the, the, you're even looking at them picking four groups of six teams like could they not have gone for six groups of four teams yes you could like, well the winners go through then two best runners to, up then it's the two games the two extra games they've taken out of yeah well, that's the thing but like I mean is Jeopardy not the, the be all and end all, all here Keith above the money um, I think Jeopardy is. I, look, I do think if you look at the um, if you look at the European Cup this year, all the home teams won except at the very end. Mm. You know, and um, so there is there often isn't that much Jeopardy. It it just hasn't worked as well. Um, look, I think there's a bigger question to this than just the the, the European Cup. Um, we've said this. You know, when we were trying to figure out 
rugby, I think it was during the lockdown, sure. We were having lots of conversations over sustainability, both in terms of travel um, and in terms of financial and the uh, uh, sustainability in terms of player welfare and the length of the season and all those different component parts. Um, if the season is 42 or 44 weeks long, it's too long. So there has to be a coordinated effort between the leagues. It has to be better than it is at the moment. There's still it's too many people kind of fighting their corner uh, that much. At times, it sounds like it's going to get better. And in, in some countries, it's better. In some countries, it's a shambles at the moment. And the viability of this is should you have squads of 55, 60 people so that you can play all these games. And then when you do have a squad of that size, are the players play, uh, match hardened enough to be able to play at the at the end of the season? Um, is it financially viable in the first place? If you look at Wales, it's the salary cap has gone so low. Um, uh, it's a very interesting decision. It's, going, it's like going back to the early days of professionalism. The decision is, do you work or do you play rugby? You know, and, and it may be better off to work. Yeah, so. yeah. Wales is, is, is a, like a whole hour-long uh, programme to get into it, but uh, Gatlin was talking during the week. And I, d I don't know if it's a stereotypical Warren Gatlin, like if he's just lobbing grenades because that's what he does, but he was saying that he wouldn't have taken the gig if he'd known how bad things were and... Um, Cathy was pointing out pre-show he's pretty well connected in Wales he kind of knows yeah. he knows the crack that's a, that's a, I, look I thought it was an, a very interesting um, interview and but it's as if he went into the job without uh, taking any view on what was going on there at all and I think most people would do that and he would be very well connected there um, he tried to explain why some of the players were leaving um, some of those made sense. I think there's an element of lobbing grenades. I think there's an element of taking pressure off the team, which he does consistently, and taking pressure off himself. And um, But yeah, it's, it was kind of an unusual element, really. And I thought he was quite harsh on young Hawkins, who had... Um, we don't know the circumstances, but for a guy who's 20 years of age, he may not have been offered... A a big contract and he may have been offered a big contract elsewhere and if you were talking and working in a company that was debating going on strike in the middle of it and somebody offered you a very good contract elsewhere I think you might go there so um, um, like sport is very unusual the emotional tug to sport is um, it just singles it out as being something unique in um, in life really and you can go for your dreams with it. It's been funny. I've been you know, talking to a couple of young players recently and describing what rugby can be for them if they wanted it as a, as a, as a career. And it's pretty much an internship for the rest of their life because you could play rugby for 10 or 12 years and retire at 30 years of age, and then you have another 35 years to work. So what has rugby given you in that period of time to be able to build it out for the next 35 years, you know? So you can start your the rest of your life a little bit later than you normally would. That's just, a, that's a way of looking at it because it's so fraught at the present moment in time with injury, with financial concerns, with the, the potential of clubs, like any person who signs on with a club and suddenly to go out of business, that's pretty. That's a pretty horrendous uh, situation. But we know it happens all the time in real world. Yeah. Well, let's talk about London Irish then, because that situation has just happened. Um, we were speaking to one of the players recently, and he was he was bringing up, um, uh, I think it was Declan Danaher, whose whose wife also was an employee of the club, and they have a, a young family. And you know, these are the the stories that. You, you don't think about when the headline stuff in the club and the debt and whether or not they're going to be able to play next season but then that collapses and all of a sudden there that's all that's left is the stories of the, the staff who are working there um, we'd spoken before about whether or not it was the right thing to do for the IRFU to get involved um, you know notwithstanding their difficulties they had been in, in we're told from the, the Telegraph certainly it's, it's mostly the English um, rugby journalists reporting on this that there had been some preliminary discussions around potentially saving the club as a, a championship club involving the IRFU. I thought it made sense 
always like a, I know you'd have to make the money work but I'm sure that there are very smart people who would be able to tap into the Irish diaspora in London very high net worth individuals over there who you could build as a bridge with Irish rugby so I don't know what's your what's your feeling about this whole thing now yeah I, look I still look I think London Irish moved away from its Irish roots when it moved to Sunbury and I think that kind of broke or moved away from Sunbury out to Reading and I think that kind of broke uh, some of that link if you look at the team uh, at the moment there are very few Irish involved in it um, I think in stepping away from it it makes it harder to do that I also think within the or the RFU um, having a team that is there ostensibly to develop Irish players, if the IRFU were to take a stake in it or take control of it, would be incredibly problematic. So part of the uh, the remit of the Premiership is to develop players to play for England. And I don't know that they'd want um, one of their main competitors uh, on their turf doing doing something similar. And I think that could be short-sighted uh, or not. I think there's merit in there because I think we are generating a fairly huge number of players um, in Ireland with only four um, four professional teams. So, uh, look, I, I do think there's merit in it. Of course I do. And I do think, um, like one of the first games I, I played with with, uh, with Munster um, was uh, against the Exiles in London Irish. And it was a mixture of the two of those. And uh, playing with Gary Owen over there with him back in the early 90s. So, it's it is a it is a long proud history, but I don't think you can just talk about London Irish. I don't think it ends at London Irish. Um, I think there's a lot of clubs under pressure. Um, there the amount of money that the owners are putting in um, is averaging four million a year on top of everything the clubs are making. So that is not sustainable. It's stark as well, Keith. When you when you look at the the Saudi involvement in golf and even at Newcastle and the money that um, Premier League football clubs are spending on players at the minute, when you compare it to rugby, it it it, it nearly highlights it and. and it's a scary thought in some ways. I don't know if it if it speaks to where rugby is at at the moment, and and you see that this, the club's struggling, of course, in the English Premiership financially. But at the, it's not in a good place. No, and I don't I don't go for the comparisons. I don't think they're I, I think they're big sports, and I, I think at times we try and drive the idea that rugby is. Um, is as big it isn't it's a complicated game um, there's been a huge amount of tinkering with the laws over the last number of years there's an, and even when we're talking about qualifications for Heineken Cup or European Cup or who gets out of what group or where or who plays who um, football is incredibly easy the laws are pretty simple um, the rules are the rules in, in soccer the rules are simple the um, it's easy to play no, great players play, make it look very easy, and they can. Um, great players can bring the game to an entirely different level. But it's a simple game that everybody can go and play. Rugby isn't that, and rugby still is niche. It's it's very big within the areas that it is big, if that makes sense. So in the, within the established countries that play it, um, and it also is a very attractive commercial venture for sponsors. Um, but it's an incredibly attritional game. And so the idea of playing for the whole year means you need much bigger squads. Um, I mean, I think we're at a really strong inflection point. I mean, I'm not giving any solution here. I, I, I think we said recently that, you know, the game can't afford to pay the salaries it's paying. Um, but I don't know whether players should play for less than those you know it's one of those absolute um, impasse where um, if you have someone who's on a couple of hundred grand a year and you say that's a good salary that's that's great and they the next salary is 50,000 is it worth it then if that becomes the question it was the question that was there at the start of professionalism it actually has come back to that point again Another question, uh, Keith, is have we missed the trick with Jean Klein or is it is it all nice and relaxed? He's, he's obviously gone off to South Africa. Um, is it mind games from Razi Erasmus? Is he trying to get in our heads? Uh, I think that would be probably overstepping it a little. Um, 
I, I know, Jerry, you asked me a question about John Klein, about how he played a couple of weeks ago and whether he'd get into the Ireland squad. I didn't see him getting into the Ireland squad. Um, I, I said I don't know that he suited what it was that Ireland wanted to do. Um, uh, and I would said that his strengths are his pinning of the um, of the scrum, um, his huge work rate, which is, has become huge. I have to say, he's uh, his amount of his tackling, his work in the mall, um, uh, his you know he's constantly um, in, he, he's in every rook. He doesn't ball carry as much. And I think he's better without ball carrying much. And I think he fits into the South African system um, better than he fits into the Irish system. So I wasn't certain he'd get into the squad. I was very surprised to see him go into the South African squad. And and that change in law was do done and designed entirely for tier two teams. It was actually the, the case in point was Issa Nasewa, um, who played 15 minutes for New Zealand and then never got to, to play for Fiji afterwards. It was, he was a case in point. And with so many teams um, um, picking players from different countries over the years and, um, and then when their time was up, which could be up pretty soon, the rest of their career mightn't be there. That was the rationale behind it. And I think that was a fairly decent rationale to try and bring up the standard of tier two. I still think you should, you know, you have to, you should make one decision and play for one country. I don't think you should be chopping and changing countries, but, um, but it wasn't done for tier one to tier one. So for me, I was very surprised with that. And I don't think it was done for that reason. But um, for John Klein, it's an unbelievable opportunity. Never thought he was going to play for the country of his birth. And he now gets an opportunity to get into a World Cup squad. Uh, Richie put a clip of Razzie talking about it on Rugby Daily yesterday and he was basically making the point that in all the tournaments they've played and in the big test series that they've played, they've run out of locks and he talked about Lou Dieger getting injured in a World Cup final and he talked about somebody else. I think uh, they still don't know about that's about whether or not he's going to be back and just made the point that the way they play is very attritional and they need loads of locks and he's a massive guy and they'd worked with him at Munster and they really liked the cut of his jib. So I, I thought that he wouldn't make the South Africa World Cup squad, but he probably would We'll get some game time in the rugby championship or whatever that tournament is called these days. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I do think fair play to him for taking advantage of the rule change when it was clear that he wasn't going to play for Ireland. And Razzie said, in fairness to them, that they voted against the rule change, but that once the rule change was made, how can we benefit from this, was his words. And that's the, that's the ruthlessness of big time professional sport, right? Absolutely. Um, there's no point, um, I, and, we, and we definitely have talked on this before, there's no point bemoaning um, the fact that there is a law that's in there and if other teams follow by it and you fall by the wayside, that's you, you, you can't allow that to happen. So it's an opportunity for for South Africa. I mean, look, I'm a little bit, I'm uncomfortable that we've um, Ben Healy I've, the, the fear I have is he could end up kicking a 65 metre kick to uh, win a match against Ireland which would frighten the life out of me or um, John Klein could come in and and, uh, and and be a changing force you know it's they're those sort of things do you mitigate against those or not well we haven't in, in, in either of those instances but it's um, look there are decisions that are made and you live you live by them but um, look you have to the laws that are put in there are put in there for a reason and they coaches coaches their ability to to exploit nuance in in law is what makes them good coaches yeah at so whatever they at their disposal i mean that's that is a harsh reality of profession sport one last thing i just wanted to ask you about was the uh, passing of paul randall um yeah the uh, judge tell us about him because a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers this morning won't know too much about his playing career no, he played. He played eighties uh, and the very start of the nineties. I, I look. I never played against him. Um, uh, I met him on loads of occasions. He so one of the things I'd always mark out is a touch of quality. Um, Jason Leonard took over from um, uh, from the judge and uh, took his place. But the two of them became unbelievable friends. You know, there were so I always met. Uh, I met Paul with Jason um, often and. 
uh, that front row of, of Probe and Moore and, uh, and Randall were, um, they, they ended up with a front row union club. They used to uh, dinners and lunches in, um, uh, in everywhere around the UK and the three of them stayed together forever. So there were always great at regaling stories and everything, but he was a, he was a cracking player um, at a time when there weren't a huge number of matches every year, um, um, I, I can't remember how many how many caps he got, but it would have been about three or four times that if he was been playing if he was playing now. But, 28, uh, 28 caps. Twenty eight, yeah. So that's it's through the eighties with only sort of four or five games, uh, you know, a year, and um, now it's up at ten or twelve a year. So. Um, but he was look, he was a good guy, really good guy, actually. Great, great fun, great guy to have a pint with. Um, and he succumbed to motor neuron disease, so that's another, um, another, uh, another one fallen, which uh, which is very tough. Um, he got diagnosed, I think, very late on uh, in last year, and his passing was very quick. But he'll be sadly missed. Okay, we will leave it there, Keith. Good stuff. Great to have you back. Thanks a million. Cheers, Chance. It's, uh, Keith, we'll give us some thoughts on the big stories in rugby at the moment. It's twenty five minutes past eight this morning. A reminder: OTB AM live with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition is available now. Uh, big weekend in rugby with Super Rugby semis in the top 14 final fingers crossed for Raj and John Ryan says Adrian Long uh, we have uh, Raj on tomorrow's show tomorrow's show yeah, yeah. Uh, Pity Robbie Keane isn't on the coaching staff for these young strikers especially to help Ferguson manage the expectation etc very similar with Robbie at that age says Quirky 1980 um, I actually think it's even better to have John O'Shea helping to coach a striker because I, I, you'd almost find it more interesting as a striker to hear from a defender what do you find difficult to play against what, what's tough to come up against what do you not like what do you love playing against as, as a striker so I think John O'Shea will bring some insight that, that maybe he didn't expect yeah I'd say as well if you're a good coach like it's about the game as opposed to I was in this situation once and I did this thing because mm. like the same river is never the same I mean, you know uh, when you're through one on one, but like every one on one situation is, mm. here's how I not Meg Figo. You know what? What part, what part of the game, the pitch are you on? Like, is somebody making a run to take the eye of the goalkeeper away? All that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, I think if you're a good coach, you can help people in circumstances and situations. And obviously, like he has a really strong support network around him as well. So. Uh, Leeds will be playing Rotherham on a random Tuesday night when Celtic will be in the Champions League it's a tough call alright says Ian Takana were you making the case that Leeds were a big club um, was, that, was that your story that was your side of the argument well no no I, I was staying very neutral it was Ashley versus Cameron Celtic versus oh, Leeds okay, okay. so I was kind of just the mediator in, in between uh, that, there was that story about the golfers trying to get involved with uh, Leeds as well but I mean I presume they're going to be involved the way LeBron James is involved with Liverpool because mm. the San Francisco 49ers just bought Leeds and they're not going to start giving it away to the golfers for nothing the same way they're all getting involved in pickleball you see this the paddleball whatever you call it they're all just buying clubs left right and centre it's the next next generation sport Jer. didn't um, didn't uh, Tom Brady buy a tour is that what he did in pickleball yeah something like that yeah and what's the difference between pickleball and paddleball I think paddleball is just the American way of saying yeah. is it possibly I, I could be wrong pickleball is pickleball is what you call it over here I think I could be wrong there. No, it's not. Paddle has a crucial advantage over paddle, its capacity to expand as a sport. Paddle courts need to be purpose built. Yeah, and there aren't many paddle courts in Ireland. I know Jenny Claffey was on with us sure, last week talking about her heading off to the European Games in, in paddle ball, I want to say. Yeah, definitely paddle. Paddle, yeah. So, I mean, they both look interesting. It's because you can whack the ball and it just goes over the net, so it's like you don't have to run as much probably good for people of a certain generation Jer. is that what you're saying to Jenny Claffey when she's not here no certainly not it, it, it's actually a tough It's a, like I'd imagine the rallies are, are long and, and arduous as well which, which which has the fitness element of it and Jenny gets to potentially be an Olympian now on top of all, all else she's achieved I, yeah I, I see the Olympic um, the Olympic rings all over the place so it's, it obviously is an Olympic sport yeah I think for the next for the next Olympics it's going to be 2028 as opposed to 2024 as far as I'm aware so it's going to become huge I think um, so yeah, I'm ready to go I might get involved bring Colin Buhig down and see not too late for you Shane yeah true I could make the Olympics yet you know just yeah. pick up a sport yeah an easy one walking it would be a good walk yeah 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 100% 29 minutes past 8 this morning um Right, so we've done those comments. Let's go to uh, let's go to Greece, sweaty Greece. Paul O'Hare, good morning to you. How are you? 
How's it going, Chair? Sweaty grease. Oh my God. What's How the, are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Well, you know, we're Irish, we're obsessed with weather. What's the weather like? Well, that's the thing. Like, it's 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 been the big kind of talking point, doesn't it? Like between Turkish training camp and and coming over here. Yes, it is hot, but I do think um, I do think the kind of reports of the the oven like conditions that the game is going to be played in tomorrow night, I think, are going to be a bit wide of the mark. It's it's um, you know the temperatures are probably in and around thirty degrees during the day here in Athens, um, but last certainly last night. Um, it was probably in and around maybe the 20 degree mark, 21 degrees, and wasn't particularly humid. There was a fair breeze blowing through the city. So I don't think it's going to be like the, the kickoff time over here tomorrow night is going to be 9.45 p.m. We're two hours ahead. Um, so by 9.45 last night, you know, it absolutely wasn't remotely kind of overbearing. Or Now, that's kind of sitting outside having a bite to eat. It's not running around the pitch. Um, so look, it will be it'll be testing but I don't think it'll be overly taxing but maybe famous last words yeah I think there was a possibility for 40 degrees when the draw was made that like you, you know the European weather is completely unpredictable as we know and there's going to be long portions of summers now which are completely uh, unsafe to go out in and that hasn't been the case so this all looks like it's it's been well managed so far up to this point the the uh, pre-match conditioning has largely taken care of any negativity that there might have been around us playing a warm weather match in June yeah I think so and I think I think Stephen Kenny he kind of he didn't come out and say it as such but kind of alluded to it during the week uh, when we were in Turkey last week at the training camp so if you think back to last June um, Ireland played four Nations League games and the first of them was over in Yerevan in Armenia and now that was properly like that was seriously hot um, and the game was also an earlier kickoff. Um, it, it was it was really really stifling. And Ireland lost that game. And you know they kind of picked up a little bit during that summer window. And they got the win over Scotland and the draw away to Ukraine and Poland. And um, so they, they finished the window with a bit of of flourish. But you, you can just sense that that Armenia game still kind of haunts Stephen Kenny a little bit. Um, and perhaps he learned, I think he learned lessons for, in terms of the preparation and in terms of the weather. Um, so they went up to Turkey for the guts of eight, nine days. And it was like it was warm in Turkey now. It felt warmer, even at night, it felt warmer in Turkey than it has done here in Athens. But, you know, just pros and cons to being away for eight, nine days. Um, the fact that the championship season obviously finished so early in May and a lot of the players just haven't had a game and the guts of five or six weeks it was good to get everybody back in training together on the flip side of that you're kind of I was going to say you're cooped up in a hotel but they're not, they weren't exactly cooped up in a hotel the, the team hotel was pretty plush and nice and there was plenty plenty to do there was nice swimming pools there was you know the, the players could go off playing golf and they were doing water polo they, they did all sorts of different things to keep themselves occupied um, but that's the kind of the catch 22 of organizing those training camps does the, the boredom set in but certainly from the interviews that we were doing over there the the vibe around the team certainly seemed to suggest that it was a well a well worth uh, a, a very useful exercise you know yes. in terms of getting away for those eight nine days so there's no i think the lessons were learned from january last year i know or from june last year i know that uh people watching and listening will be like well of course they're going to tell you everything is grand but actually when you're in a place with a large group you can tell from looking at them is this group happy in each other's company or is there tension are they bored like i think of the the uh euros and the amount of time that they um under trap where everybody they just just they looked a little bit bored there was rumors of stuff happening of like you know it, stuff seeps out so the stuff seeping out it seems like is most people seem to be happy enough in each other's company yeah, for sure. Look, I, I remember back in 2012, um, Euro 2012 in Poland and Ukraine, Ireland went to Italy for a 10-day training camp in Monte Catini, um, uh, sort of a place that Trapattoni had brought his, I think his former Juventus team to, and um, it was just kind of, it was almost like a semi-retirement home. It was that sleepy, it was such a sleepy old village, and the players players we were there for the cut to 10 or 11 days and you'd often bump into players out sort of walking around the town in the evening and you know 
they were bored out of their minds basically um, and there was a lot I think track really really overdid the training sessions in Montecatini there would have been a lot of double sessions um, a lot of a lot of sort of serious uh, serious training in, in very very hot temperatures whereas the interesting thing from Stephen Kenny's point of view in Turkey last week was that while um, it was important to get the squad together having uh, you know the vast majority of them haven't played football in five or six weeks as I was saying um, he didn't do double training sessions which I thought was interesting not 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 suggesting he should have but he, they were they trained early in the mornings they were usually at the training ground by about nine o'clock uh, training ground was only about a three or four minute bus ride from their from their hotel and they were well out of the town the, the sort of the resort area so they, they were kind of locked away in their own sort of isolated area and the training ground was the same training ground that Martin O'Neill used uh, in 2018 when we were here when we were in Antalya as well the, the, the game that Declan Rice made his Ireland debut in and was uh, crying in the mix zone um, afterwards because he was so emotional about it all um, but yeah Kenny was just Kenny was there if there were single training sessions each day in Turkey so they, they were they were sharp they were intensive according to the players and to the coaches that we bumped into around the team hotel and in some of the media interviews we did but they weren't overworked is, is certainly the sense that we would have got and um, they had been looking to play they had been looking to play a sort of a, a game um, in Turkey um, but that didn't materialise they were looking for teams in the region didn't materialise so they played an 11 v 11 70 minute match against each other um, on Saturday just before the Champions League final they tried to play the game as late as possible in the evening to kind of replicate the kickoff time in, in Athens but uh, they, they were they were only playing 70 minutes so they could get back and watch the, watch the Champions League final In terms of the decision making Stephen Kenny has to make Paul with uh, team selection like how important is, is picking players that have played football relatively recently I guess from an attacking sense we were chatting to Vinnie Perth in studio yesterday and in terms of who's off or behind Evan Ferguson you have options there in terms of Abba Femi or, or Will Smallbone Mikey Johnston is an option as well do you know what way Stephen Kenny might be leaning in that sense in an attacking sense? We don't really, as such, um, like the, Kenny's formations are fairly fluid, and you know, you, 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 three four three, three five two, um, and a lot of Kenny's selection uh, issues are kind of formation dependent as well, and particularly in those tacking areas. Um, but look, he, he does have a lot of he does have a lot of decisions to make. Um, I think it's absolutely nailed on that Evan Ferguson starts. He has to start, and he will. Um, it's just a matter of who who kind of plays off him. You would have uh, Michael Obafemi uh, certainly in the mix. You'd have Adam Ida, who Kenny Kenny's always been a big, big fan of. And and you know, don't forget Ida. Adam Ida didn't play a single game for Ireland in 2022 because of his injury problems. Um, and Kenny Kenny has just been such a big fan of, of Ida, and you know, he's got such a prolific scoring rate for Irish underage teams. And um, so Kenny's a big fan of his. You've got Troy Parrish in the mix as well. Um, I wouldn't be necessarily too swayed by the fact that Troy Parrish was put up for interviews during the week. It's not always an indication of um, of Kenny's thinking in terms of team selection. Um, Michael Obafemi was actually down to do media stuff with us at the training ground in Turkey the other day, along with Callum O'Dowda. But um, in the in the couple of minutes from the end of the training session to when he was walking over to us at the side of the pitch, we were sort of higher up in the stands, um, up near the press working area. He was being brought up there. But uh, whatever happened um, between himself and conversations with either the management team or the FBI communications team, Michael Abafemi pulled out of those interviews. Uh, we weren't really given any reason as to why. And Troy Parrish was sort of added in as a last minute sub. Um, Troy obviously, you know, Troy didn't Troy didn't make the match day squad in the end for the France game. He was in the initial squad, but he wasn't in the match day squad. Although he did admit to us the other day that he probably wasn't at his fittest for that, so that may be a reasoning. But um, I think yeah, Evan Ferguson starts, and then it's it's one or other, I would say, of of Michael Obafemi and Adam Ida. He loves he loves Ida, and we haven't really spoken about what the formation would look like with Ida there. Um, can they? Can they both change? Are they? Because they, I think I'm trying to get to the point where they both seem like stereotypical number nines in many respects. But actually, they both have enough in their skill set to be able to do other things as well. How would they combine? How would Ida and Ferguson combine? 
Well, that's the thing. Like, you know, Kenny was talking to us the other day about how, you know, trying to make um, Evan Ferguson fit into Ireland's system is, is you know, he, he just sort of, we were asking him about it and he just turns around and goes, well, that's my job to work out what the best uh, way of getting the best out of Evan Ferguson is because he's making the point that at Brighton, the way Brighton play, while well, Ferguson's notionally a centre forward, he will drop so deep that he could end up he could end up on the halfway line because Brighton's two wingers play so high that they will draw the centre backs either side, and you know the, the centre backs are occupied by the two high wingers, and then that creates the space for for those wingers to play the ball into Ferguson, who'll make a who'll make a dash forward uh, into space, and that's where he's been sort of utilised for Brighton. <laughs> Whether Ireland, you know, try and sort of mimic that a little bit more, I don't know. You would have seen in the France game, Ferguson kind of leading the line and he was kind of dropping deep a lot. Um, but that was probably to do with the nature of the opponents as well. I, I would personally like to see a little bit more of Ireland's rather than Ferguson dropping deep tomorrow to receive the or to receive the ball. I'd love to see Ireland's with maybe Ferguson on the front foot and maybe sort of playing a little bit higher up the pitch. Um, and Ida, like, yeah, it's like Ida has been, you know, Kenny, Kenny had tried him in, in a couple of different positions, you know, prior to his injury um, in terms of maybe a sort of wider on the left. But, you know, he, he is, you're right in what you're saying in terms of they are a little bit similar in terms of out and out number nines and maybe that's where Michael Obafemi comes into play because of of his play pace that he, he can play in behind Ferguson if Ferguson is going to drop a little bit deeper uh, to receive ball and maybe link a little bit, bit of play but Obafemi's pace like he's he's just absolutely lightning you know as is Mikey Johnson who's who's down as one of the five forwards yeah. in, in the squad you know well, when, he, like, he is he, he is essentially a winger but he's down he's down as a forward as such so. he, he thinks of himself in uh, any one of a number of different um, positions judging from his own comments and, and how happy he will be to play in those and actually the way you're describing Brighton there you could see Kenny thinking Mikey Johnson might be one of those players who plays and occupies the uh, the centre backs in that kind of in between space so plenty for him to get his teeth into and, and stuck into one other one that we just were unsure of how fit is Darrow Shea? Yeah well that's like the, you know when Darrow Shea got that injury a while a few months ago the, you know West Brom were pretty much ruling him out for the season um, now he obviously did come back a little bit earlier than expected that, that's, a, that's a selection call to make for Kenny as well um, if you you know he, he does play three centre backs so you're, you're certainly looking at Nathan Collins on the right side um, you're looking at Johnny Egan in the middle and then Darrow Shea like Stephen Kenny is a huge fan of Darrow Shea's and O'Shea you know has, O'Shea has proved to be sort of versatile in, in being able to play in any of those positions across the back um, but that is the big selection call there's no Andrew Oma Bamadeli here there's no Shane Duffy here um, so Daryl Lenehan of Middlesbrough would be uh, possibly the next in line he has been playing up until quite recently because Middlesbrough are in the playoffs they got to the playoff semi-final um, and he's, 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 he's been playing every single week for, for Middlesbrough and has had a strong season so I think that's the other big selection call in my view would be um, whether Kenny goes and trusts O'Shea despite the injury issues that he had um, and the fact that he doesn't have the same amount of games in his legs that Daryl Lenehan has so that, yeah that, that's that's suddenly sort of a, a position that's come into sharper focus for Kenny I know we, we, we generally spend uh, a lot of time in Irish media talking about uh, the starting team that Kenny opt, opts with but I guess when, when you're playing in heat and I know you're saying you know the heat mightn't be as big a factor as we thought but the team you finish with is often the, the more important thing Paul as well and the bench is going to be so key I, I guess one aspect of that is that the, the uh, presumably a straight choice between Odauda and James McLean uh, wide left uh, and whoever doesn't get picked uh, and presumably Odauda is the number one choice but McLean is going to be very very important as well yeah for sure yeah I think Colin Odauda is nailed on for that position um, Kenny Kenny bigs him up an awful lot every time he talks to us you know he, he really really likes Odauda and I, we, we spoke to Odauda at the training ground the other day for interviews and he was making the point that he's um he, you know, he really wants to make that position his own, and he, he feels that he's a sort of a natural fit in terms of his athletic ability. Um, but he did acknowledge that he's had to work on his sort of defensive side of his game because, you know, when he broke into the Ireland squad first under was it Martin O'Neill, I think. Um, he certainly would have played in a more advanced position. Um, 
but Kenny definitely really really rates him um, as, as a wing back uh, you know probably more from an attacking sense maybe than defensively James McLean will well, I'm certain I'm pretty sure he'll have some sort of role to play because he's obviously on 98 caps and if he if he's to even play 30 seconds on uh, on Friday night he'll be in line to win his 100th cap against Gibraltar on Monday night and um, I'd be yeah, it's a funny one in a way because you'd be surprised if that wasn't in everyone's thinking and you know give give James McLean a big night and, on Monday night but then if the game tomorrow night isn't going well for Ireland in any shape or form Kenny's not he's not one for just dishing out caps um, and he said that before whether it's newcomers who come along or uncapped players who might have been in a few squads and never got on or goalkeepers third choice goalkeepers being thrown on in friendlies he's not one for really doing that too often so I think things would want to be going reasonably well for Ireland um, or you know if it's if it's a tight if, it, if, if it's if the game is level with sort of 20 minutes to go and McLean is exactly that throw the kitchen sink kind of player that you see so often at Aviva Stadium when he comes on with 20 minutes to go and Ireland are shooting into the south stand and you know everyone's on the edge of their seats and the place is place is definite so I'd expect McLean to feature at some point Alright Paul we leave it there good stuff uh, enjoy the next 48 hours or so Th- thanks a million for joining us Cheers lads thank you It's uh, Paul here, there Chief Football Writer with the Irish Daily Mirror giving us his thoughts from Athens this morning it's good news about the weather not being uh, so hot we don't like it hot mm. uh, Carl Carl Malani good morning to you 845 hey, how are you Are you well not so bad Dublin's Lego nervous Ah, look at it. I mean, it's uh, good to be there. <laughs> um, no, look at it. I mean, it's it's uh, look at it. It's going to be a case of trying to be as competitive as possible for as long as possible. But I think that's what the teams like Sligo and and you know the likes of Westmead that are in the All Ireland series need exposure to the top teams as much as possible. I think to progress. So would be hopeful of a reasonably good performance because they've played well they, they pushed Ruscommon uh, got a goal in the second half to get back to within two Drew with Kildare uh, I think it's been a very progressive year so hopefully they can round it out with a reasonable performance and they still have a chance of going through as well depending on how the other game goes I actually like going to games at Kingspan Refney Park I think it's a good atmosphere my thoughts are with the Kingspan Refney Park uh, grounds keeping staff this weekend you have Cavan down 5.15 on Saturday evening then you have the, the Dublin Sligo match at 1.45 on Sunday that's a double header because after the 4 o'clock it's Tyrone Westmeath okay. so like Right, Breffney's going to get serious use this weekend. Yeah, it's three big games within what less than twenty four hours. Yeah, and the pitches are so rock hard now. Yeah, so it's going to be difficult. But um, yeah, lovely ground, uh, good atmosphere, as you say, and um, good that they actually that it is a double header that'll boost the atmosphere. You'd hope mm. for both matches, um, because I know there was some talk last weekend after the Leinster hurling final about whether Crow Park is the right place to play fixtures like that with twenty four thousand in a in a big big stadium and you know even though there was the big moment at the end I did feel it kind of felt a little bit muted because it was 24,000 mm. in a, an 80,000 capacity stadium so there is probably a bit of thinking to do about venues uh, going forward but then you have the case of Galway and Armagh playing in Carrick and Shannon I think both counties requested that that game be moved from there because of the demand for tickets and it's it's still in Carrick and Shannon well, That double header is interesting in that you're going to have the Throne and Dublin fans together together but not playing against each other so a little bit of harmony maybe chance to Break some peace. Yeah, peace in our peace, time. There's peace between fans, right? Ah, surely. Maybe yeah. our match round there isn't, but no, not quite. That's a double header that's worth worth watching. The week, the weekend weather is going to be cat, basically. Really, apart from the sunny southeast, I think everywhere else, and even then, Saturday and then Sunday, it's like yeah, it's so hot and rainy and muggy. Ugh. Perfect upset weather. If there was <laughs> going to be an upset somewhere, Kildare Scammon maybe. Ah. Oh. Do, I, I don't know. Uh, well, Kildare have been threatening a performance, haven't they, so far this season? Have they? they? Breakthrough. Have they? Well, they pushed Dublin close. Twice in the in the league as well. Yeah. But then Dublin in the league were awful, it turned out. You know Either way, Davy Burke won't be in his local in Minute, I'd say, after the match this weekend. And maybe That's, he will, you know. Maybe he will. Toasting, toasting yeah, a Roscommon like, victory. You know, it's a big weekend. I think, you know, we're going to see the teams now really focusing in on trying to produce performances now because you're getting to the business end and I'm really interested to see where Kerry and Dublin are at because I think Galway and Mayo are both ahead of them in the pecking order as things stand I think Galway are the team to beat mm. uh, you know they would be the team that, that I think look best placed at the moment um, Kerry you know don't seem to be at the level that they were at last year Dublin still have a lot of questions to answer but then again when you get to Crow Park and you get to the quarterfinal stage yeah. you just wonder will these teams cut loose well, at that point I think we're, as it stands we're more likely to see Kerry next week in the preliminary quarterfinal the sexually titled preliminary quarterfinal weekend mm. what was your name forward again? 
wild card weekend. weekend yeah <laughs> right <laughs> but the carry carry could also finish third wild yes. all over the country wild <laughs> <laughs> you see if carry finish third that's that's it. they're going to have a tantalizing preliminary quarter final regardless away from home well they'll finish second right we 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 we're almost certain they're going to finish second right i i've been banging the loud drum for quite some time i think there's a big result there's a big result coming i th- i said they'd be closer to mayo than people realize there's only point in it um but th- and the fact that that game's in Port Leash as well Kerry Loud is going to have a, be a big barometer as to where Kerry are at like I don't think it is I think they're going to win this game by four points and then next week they'll win that game by four points and then it's all Ireland quarter final weekend the weekend after and that's like I think this is I think we're entering into a period where we're going to see the best teams playing each other in games that matter and all the whining about oh, too many games too many games is going to disappear mm, has this not been amazing for Sligo I would say it has been very, very progressive. Yeah, like I mean, I think for teams like Sligo, it's the the new format actually gives a real opportunity to say, yeah, we can be a top sixteen team. And I think there are other teams, you know, the likes of Cavan, uh, Westmead are in it this year. Like Wexford have shown a lot of progress in the Talton Cup. I think they'll take momentum from that into Carlo next year. as well. Yeah, there's Carlo as well. Yeah, so like it's been very progressive. And I think you know Carlo have played, I think five championship matches now so far this season. So they've obviously made a lot of progress uh, under Niall. And, and done really really well so I think the new format has been quite progressive I think it can be tweaked in terms of maybe eliminating the need for the preliminary quarterfinals in both competitions uh, just to make the, the group stages that little bit more competitive and have a bit more riding in all the group matches you could have a wildcard weekend where not uh, it's not four matches but actually two matches and then it's hell for leather and you you, you know you need to come up with a, a, a fair system for analysing which team's scoring average is better or you know mm-hmm. that needs to be weighted somehow but like and also we just need to get rid of the provincial championships having any impact on this part of the competition right mm. although then Sligo wouldn't have made it yeah like there are tweaks that could be made I think there will be tweaks um, but I think by and large I think it's been relatively successful and I think th- the counties have been quite happy to get more game time and you mentioned the likes of the, the Sligo's of this world the counties that are trying to develop and gain exposure to the top teams I think it's been very useful uh, for them so I would anticipate maybe small tweaks but not not nothing too major yeah two other quick points that everybody's been complaining all oh, the attendances are a bit low it's like well make the tickets cheaper and do some marketing like it's the job of the county boards to market their own teams and to sell to their fans that this is actually important you're getting to see our best players play games our management team are taking this game seriously you need to take it seriously too and like uh, come and there might be some entertainment that might be useful as opposed to like an old tape recorder which is like so you know come on county boards let's be having you Mm. yeah Inevitably, though, you're going to have smaller crowds. If you have more matches, you're going to have smaller crowds. I mean, people cannot travel every weekend, particularly with the cost of everything now. Yeah. And cheaper tickets there are would help. Big distances involved. Yeah. Cheaper tickets would definitely help. May well help. Like, uh, as opposed to, oh, we, we always charge this for a championship match. Like, yeah, because you used to have one and you were price gouging uh, all the years when you only had one. And now you have three, you don't need to price gouge anymore. Mm. Fair point. Yeah. Fair point. I think it's group two that I'm going to be keeping an eye on Galway, Armagh, and Throne Westmeath. Like, Galway top on four points, Throne and Armagh are level on two, but also level on points difference, a minus one as well. So, whoever comes comes out on top, I'd expect Galway to beat Armagh. But I mean, between Throne and Armagh again, then to finish with Throne, I guess, only need a result then against Westmeath to get the second second place position. But that group is, uh, is possibly the most delicately poised. Mm. It's the most interesting, I think. Mm. Certainly the most competitive. Anything else going on, Carl? Well, we have the US Open golf starting later on today. Five Irish players in the field. I know you'll be previewing that with Joe later on. Uh, in the Nations League last night, Croatia beat the Netherlands 4 2 after extra time to qualify for the final. They'll play either Spain or Italy in the final. Those two meet tonight from 7 45. Fixtures for the new Premier League season out in seven minutes time uh, the uh, newly promoted side Luton set to find out who they'll play in their first ever Premier League match and uh, Jude Bellingham set to be unveiled as a Real Madrid player later on today and racing at Leopardstown this evening first off there at a quarter to five all right good stuff Carl thanks Thanks for that 853 uh, OTBIM live with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back neon edition is available now I'm delighted to say Shawnee Johnson is with us Shawnee good morning to you how are you morning man how are you um, we were saying and making the point that um, Cavan Down in the Talton Cup is as big a game as there can be in the Talton Cup really because I think everybody expected one of these two teams to win it and they haven't managed to avoid each other uh, might be um, they might both be regretting that but this is about as good as it gets for the Talton Cup yeah um, it is and I suppose from a Cavan perspective 
if you're going to get down, you're better getting them now in a in a, in a home quarter final. So, um, bringing them to Breffy Park is should be obviously be an advantage to Cavan. They've beaten them there already this year. Um, but like you'd expect this if if the Talton Cup was you know, really, really well uh, followed. You'd expect this to be a big crowd, but I think there was a very small crowd in, in Yori and Park Esther for Down and, and Longford. So I don't know how much of a, a crowd Down are going to bring to it. But, you know, as far as the Talton Cup goes, this is as good as it's going to get. They're, you're expecting one of the winners to come from this. Mead will obviously uh, have a say. I know they pipped down there a week or two ago. But I think the winners will come from this, from this quarter final. Tell me, is this... Has this been accepted as the be all and end all for Cavan intercounty football this year? Is has it captured the imagination of football followers in Cavan? No, I don't think it has. Um, I think there was a real, a real hope. And I know from from speaking on the show before that Cavan would would beat our man the first round of the championship in Breffney. I think Cavan followers thought that you know they're after winning Division 3 they had a reasonably well a very good second half performance against Fermanagh in the league final that they would give Armagh a real game um, and you know uh, hope to get through that game and then you're looking at playing a downer Donegal and Donegal weren't going great at the time and you know down ended up turning them over so you'd be looking at down in the semi-final and a potential route to, a, to an Ulster final to get you in to compete for the Sam Maguire so um but for the Cavan, you know, the Cavan set up, this game is now huge because, you know, the, the big carrot of the Talton Cup is that Cavan don't need to worry about about league status. Obviously, you're, you're, they'll look to, to go and have a really good Division 2 next year and potentially get up to Division 1, which is where they want to be. But this, the carrot is like Westmead to get, to get straight into the Sam Maguire next year and be playing against the big guns all the time. The uh, the down um, setup is interesting as well, Shawnee. And we were speaking during the week, like Conor Laverty and, and his assistant Mickey Donnelly were speaking about it. Uh, the fringe players in the down panel, essentially, if you're not in the say first 18, 19 sort of players, they're being released back to their clubs in the last couple of weeks, even to play you know thirty, forty minutes of a game. Uh, what do you make of this? It's, it's it seems like common sense, I suppose. I love it to be honest uh, you know you look at yourself you put yourself in that player's perspective if you're 19 or 20 or even if you're 22 23 and you're you know like the player I always say the player always knows you, you know you can have a you can have an idea in your head or a really really positive attitude oh I might get game time I might get game time but at the end of the day you know most players are fairly realistic they know where they're, where they're at in the grand scheme of things they know if they're likely to get 5 minutes or 40 minutes or, or no minutes and I just think it's such a, a a good and novel idea by the down management because if you want an impact off the bench, you're far more likely to get it than from someone that's coming in more than likely with a little bit of confidence after playing decently with their club. Obviously, the standard of club football, the county football is is uh, a good bit different. It, it's, it's certainly reduced. So you're coming in off probably having a decent performance. You're back playing with the people that you've, you've grown up with. You're coming in in, in better better attitude, better, uh, you know, just happier really because, you know, you're, the, the county setup, if you're not playing, can be really demanding on players physically and mentally. Obviously, physically, it's difficult with the amount of training and so on. But even mentally, you know, you put yourself in an environment, a really high performance environment. You want to get the best out of yourself. You want to be getting game time. And if you're not getting it, it can be, it can become really, really tough. So just being released back to the club to play X amount of minutes, it's it's twofold. It's getting you that confidence. It's also getting you more game time. That means that if you're going to be asked to come in uh, to a real pressurized environment, you're, you're more likely to be more ready. Presumably, as a player, you would have liked this whole setup. You know, games week to week, as opposed to training sessions. That seems to be the general consensus that players like matches. Absolutely, <laughs> Absolutely. you know, it, it just the the fear on the Monday or the Tuesday night when you when you have a three week break is just you wake up at whatever time seven in the morning until until you arrive to the Breffney Park or wherever you're just going off oh, what could this entail this could be anything if we have a three week break is there going to be running sessions or what are we going to be doing so at least if you know week on week you know it's going to be more ta- more tactical more technical working on skill set working on on uh, position stuff working on kick outs it's not going to be too taxing on the body so yeah week on week is nice but obviously the downside of it is boys if you get if you get any type of niggle uh, you're potentially missing. If you, you know, if you pull up there during the week, you're potentially missing a, a full roof. If you pull a hamstring or something like that, you're, it, it's hard to get back now. 
I was just looking back at the um, the result from the first round of the Ulster Championship that you were talking about the Cavan Armagh game it was back in April it feels like a different world it feels like the sport is different when the weather is good I've been talking a little bit about this over the last few months that like the competition starts in one season and it's finishing you know let's wait and see what the weather's like this weekend and over the next couple of weeks but it, it I'm hopeful that the bad football is over and the good football is about to begin <laughs> just your, your great optimism um, yeah no look it is, I think over it's been a lot of shadow boxing you can say over the last couple of weeks now you're coming into uh, you know there's a lot of matches that are do or die in some of the group stages that people need results uh, there's still a place or two up for grabs in terms of preliminary quarter finals um, you know you're seeing some of the big teams not guaranteed to be in the top two uh, which obviously second and third is a world of difference because you know what I mean if you're if you're finishing third in a group and you draw Kerry and Killarney now obviously that duck has been broken by Mayo going down there but it's a really really tough draw so you're hoping that with uh, improved conditions um, that you know turnovers will be less but you know that just means the teams are potentially going to sit in more and, 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 and make teams try and break them down and that's what we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks so there's been a lot of possession based football uh, I don't see that it's going to change really just because the conditions have changed. Okay. Um, in terms of the hierarchy of, of where teams are and how they're performing at the moment, nobody has yet really laid down a marker and said we're the best team in the country by far or clearly. And uh, I think that's also a good thing in terms of there being a, a sense of us not knowing exactly what's going to happen. Whereas in previous years, we were basically penciling Dublin plus one into an Ireland final and saying they're the only two teams who could who could make it that far. Absolutely, like I think that's great. You know what I mean? You, as you said, from let's go back to, okay, I think in 2012, Mayo beat Dublin in a semi-final. So from there, you know, you're looking at 10 years where you're looking at Dublin nearly getting to every final. I know they got pipped last year, but it, it's novel, it's new. There's a lot of teams with 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 new hope. Like you're looking at Galway, seem to have their ship really well in order at the minute. They're probably looking the most likely. Mayo went to Kerry and won. Kerry aren't going well, but they're you know they're they're going to come back with a kick to win this weekend. They'll have a home quarter final. They'd expect them to be in the semi final. Then uh, Tyrone had a good win against Armagh. Armagh will still see themselves as contenders if they can get something out of this weekend, which will be tough for them. But they're they're more than likely still going to be in a quarter final. They could end up going to Killarney. So. I think over the next couple of weeks you're going to see a lot of the heavyweights coming against each other in a heavyweight environment where if you get knocked out you're gone where over the last couple of weeks you had a couple of heavyweights but they, they knew they had you know uh, a rematch clause or whatever you want to call, call it that they had another opportunity of, of getting uh, of getting back into the fold so that's why it makes it exciting the next whatever five, six weeks there's going to be some big heavyweight battles I think you called when we, at the start of the, the championship when we had John Shawnee you called Mayo wasn't it to win the All-Ireland and, and like I suppose they haven't done much to, to dissuade you since like the, the Kerry performance was brilliant and the live game as Tommy was saying yesterday in the power rankings you know if Louth haven't scored that 1-1 one, one in, in injury time they win mm. that game by 4 or 5 points and that's it um, do you still stand by Mayo for the All-Ireland? Well, I kind of have to yeah. and they're, they're looking strong and when you look at the Mayo bench like it was the same against Kerry I think they brought on Durkin they brought on Hessian they brought on Fionn McDonough they brought on Tommy Conroy so they're doing probably what they haven't done before where they're kind of holding these boys in reserve and going okay with 20-25 minutes to go we're going to bring on real power real pace in Conroy Hessian Durkin uh, Fionn McDonough can play he can kick a point I think he kicked a point when he came on the last day as well so they're they're doing what all the best teams that have won all Ireland. You look at the Dublins, where they were able to introduce people off the bench that are going to make a difference. Now, I, I don't know. Kevin McStay will only notice. Uh, you, you know, we're not privy to what's going on in the old training. Maybe these boys aren't performing well enough to start. Who knows? But they're they're definitely household names in terms of Conroy, Durkin, especially Hessian's a really good player. You know, we saw that goal that he scored in the, in the in the league this year. He's really, really high skill set, and he's a good defender. He's a good man marker as well. So they have real options off the bench now, which gives them a real chance. Strength and depth is is, is a crucial thing, Sean, isn't it? Like we were making the point yesterday. Like you know, say Derry lose a Shane McGuigan to injury, touch wood, and then what, they're gone. Then they're gone. like an Armagh could be something similar, maybe with Ryan O'Neill. Um, like you look around and you try and find a team that actually wouldn't suffer with a big injury or two. There aren't many, but. Galway have more strength and depth for example this year than they had last 
Well, they do because they have Burke back and they have Peter Coop back, and then Tierney's a young lad who's who's really really good player, and then you're adding in Walsh, and I think Comer came off the bench the other day and kicked three points, and he's obviously a big player for them. So there's five or six really 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 good players straight away, and then they brought on Tom O'Callaghan, who's a good player as well. So they have real depth, and that's only in the attacking sense. So you know you look at it's like anything you mentioned Derry there, but at the minute if you mention Kerry and you take Clifford out, they're going to really struggle as well. If you mention Dublin and you take O'Callaghan out they're going to struggle as well so there's there's a couple of really key players that you need to keep fit you know Mayo have them too Galway have them as well that if you're down them you, you know it, things are going to be a lot harder for you but I just see with the likes of Mayo and Galway and Galway in particular now, they have such strength and depth like, like Comer's such a key player to them to go to Westmead uh, not in a must win game but knowing that Westmead had a good performance the week before and to bring Comer off the bench and he kicks three points so Shane Walsh only kicked a point from play. So if you're if you're looking at Westmead and you're seeing that, you're really, really happy. If you were given that before the game, you'd take their hand off. Uh, and then Gaul would just have difference makers on the bench at the minute, which is probably it's it's definitely gonna have a big uh, a big effect later on down the line, you'd imagine. Uh, news coming through in the last hour that as it stands, Rian O'Neill has had his uh, appeal against his red card. Uh, turned down now I think they can still go further I don't know which stage that was at but the decision to enforce the one match suspension was upheld according to Belfast Telegraph so um, Arma haven't clicked and they're they're desperately looking for a performance out of nowhere and not having Rian O'Neill is not going to help them no it's definitely not I'm looking at them early on in the year when they were out Rian O'Neill they didn't have him in Breffney Park he came on he made that goal line clearance um, but yeah, he's a loss to them, you know, and uh, he's a loss to them from dead balls as well because Armagh are, are, are struggling really to to score a huge amount. You know, he, they kicked eleven points against Tyrone. They were pretty poor up front against Westmead. They got that goal from Turbot. Turbot started the year like a house on fire. I think they need to stick with Turbot to be honest because he has quality. Um, but the thing is, they missed a couple of really easy frees when Reid O'Neill wasn't on the field against Tyrone. And honestly, if you're not scoring that much, you have to find different ways to score, whether that be utilising the mark or utilising frees and winning frees at, say, the 45-metre line or 42 or 41 metres out and having a really, really established free taker who you know is going to kick 80% of those 45-metre meter frees. And that is Reid O'Neill, and that gives you a chance in matches where if you're struggling to score and you're winning these frees and then you're missing them it just drains the energy out of teams um, look they're going to give Galway a game are they good enough to beat Galway Like th- they've played twice over the last year and both games have been extremely extremely tight so there will not, they're not be much in it but you look at you just look at the mindset of the two teams going in Galway are uh, probably on a crest of a wave Connacht champions one or two games um, what does that do to their mindset yes they're going in full of confidence uh, I'm thinking Galway are already true um, but they'll, you know, they'll want to top the group just to give them that extra week off. Armagh are going to have to come out all guns blazing. It's just whether they can score enough to beat Galway. Okay. The last thing I wanted to ask you about was the the other group: uh, Dublin, Sligo, Roscommon, Kildare. Basically, yeah. Roscommon need to beat Kildare uh, well to stay uh, to give themselves a, a good uh, chance of of finishing top. Realistically, you'd expect Dublin to beat Sligo by enough for that match. Um, in that match for them to finish top but it's not beyond the bounds possibility that Roscommon do Kildare in this game is it? No I think Roscommon are a point ahead of Dublin at the minute scoring wise um, but yeah, Kildare have to win like uh, Kildare have to get something out of this game but the big thing now is for Kildare and Sligo you have a decision to make if you're Tony McEntee like l- let's be realistic uh, you're, we're, I'm all for optimism and anything can happen but Sligo are not going to beat Dublin now it's can Sligo contain Dublin in the hope that Roscommon outscore Kildare by six, seven, eight points. And it's whether Sligo can make a 70-minute game into where the ball is on the field for 70 minutes into where the ball is on the field for 42, 43 minutes. Where, you know, they're trying to make things as slow as possible, contain Dublin, slow the game down, exactly like Roscommon did if they get possession, trying to keep it for as long as possible so that Dublin don't have the ball in their hand. Now it's going to be difficult for them and they have quality up front Sligo that's my worry for Sligo is that they they love to play so they have uh, Carabine they have Murphy they have uh, uh, Patrick O'Connor Alan Riley come in and kick 1-3 the last day but they're going to need to be so tight defensively and that's one thing that they're that they're not really um, but it's a bit it, this is a big game for, for all four because 
like I, I do feel getting that extra week allows bodies to come back. Like Dublin will want to top the group. I think Costello missed the last day with an ankle injury. You know, having that extra week is big for him. But it's also going to be big for Roscommon because you don't know what you're going to pull out of the hat with a third place team. So you could get a really tough draw. Now I know if Roscommon finish second, they'll be in the hide and they'll be confident of beating anyone there. But you could still get a really sticky draw. So top in the group is is very very important. Uh, realistically, who do you expect to, to finish top of this group? Well, I expect Dublin to do enough to like to, Roscommon beat Sligo by ten. I know it was tied at half time. But if Sligo come and play, we've seen what happens if you try and come and play against Dublin with Loud. Uh, now, obviously, I think it's in O'Connor Park, which is different to Crow Park. But you're expecting Dublin to win by 10 plus. Uh, are Ross Common going to do that to Kildare? Kildare know they need to get something out of the game uh, to get through. And, and look, going into the last game, you'd probably, Kildare were probably expecting that they'd be more or less true in the knowledge that Dublin had Sligo in the last game and they didn't do their job in the first game to get over Sligo and fair play to Sligo. I think they kicked the last two or three points in that game. But I expect Dublin to top the group, Russ Common to be second and I think Kildare will probably get through and score in difference. Kildare have been pretty um, uh, uh, difficult to find the exact word apart from disappointing in terms of how they've progressed this season because there's been patches of good play. There's been moments in games where it looks like they've got a style and a bit of identity forming and then the next game they go out and, and don't do anything like it or even within the same match in the second half of matches in a Sligo game in particular um, so what, where, what's your assessment of where they are at the moment in their, in their evolution? Really hard to put your finger on it isn't it? Like you look at the Dublin game and you go Ooh, you know this is a group that are are all in really you know it was such a which is what you expect, you know, a really committed, uh, passionate, well-organised, really put Dublin to the pin of their collars and, and looked like winning the game with, with 10 minutes to go. And then you're just going, OK, first round of the of the All-Ireland series, OK, we're away, that's fine, it's a difficult enough environment to go to Markovic Park, but just get in and get out of there with a win. And you're nearly guaranteed a place in the, in the preliminary quarterfinals. And they didn't do that. And then you go and play Dublin again and, you know, it's a nine point, it's very comprehensive really, you know, it's not, there's games where Dublin, you, you can keep them to three, four and then they'll pull away. It didn't really feel like that. It looked like Dublin were in fairly good enough control. And I know Cluxon pulled off a really good save at one stage from, from Dara Carwin that could have tightened the gap a bit. But yeah, they're, they're unknown really at, at the minute. Like I think if you're, if you're honest and you're the other teams uh, and they get through you're looking to pull them out of the draw in the quarter final that's where they're at really yeah are there any teams finally Shawnee for me just beyond that realm of teams we usually speak about we, we spoke about Ross Common there but you think of 2010 and we spoke about the the madness of the 2010 All-Ireland there yesterday uh, and Cork and Down getting all the way to a final mm-hmm. like could the likes of Cork or Ross Common or Derry say to Monaghan um, be in serious contention here if they can if they can build up a little bit of steam yeah, I don't think they're well, well yeah Derry uh, I've said uh, have a real chance and, and Derry that hasn't I don't think they're as good now and I don't think they're going to be as good but they're sti- they still haven't lost so they looked under under pressure against Monaghan to pull that out you know they, they had a good win in Donegal which is no matter how Donegal are going it's still not an easy place to go uh, they're going to be defensively sound they're going to get goals still because of, of the way they play and if they don't get goals they're probably going to struggle so they're, they're still there like Cork to me Cork can trouble anyone like we saw last weekend you know that decision with the powder decision uh, I'm still looking at it a, a couple of times uh, you know, I think Ganey has a, has a run at him and kind of goes into him it, it's, it's a harsh enough call so you know they're putting Kerry to the pin of their collar are Kerry going well at the minute no but Kerry are definitely all Ireland contenders so Cork Cork can cause teams trouble because they can score and they can kick from distance and they're they believe in themselves too, which is a which is a massive a massive factor. And if they can keep Powder fit uh, and Hurley fit, then they'll cause people trouble. But you're still looking at. I think it's gone from the last ten years. There was only two, two, three teams maybe to come in the All Ireland. Now you're probably looking at five or six, which is definitely a, a greater. But I don't see anyone really coming out of the pack to win it. They might beat someone in a one-off game, but I can't see them winning three one-off three three games to win the All Ireland. Yeah. All right, Shawnee, we leave it there. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Great to have you with us. Thanks very much, man. Enjoy your day. Shawnee Johnson there giving us a preview of the uh, weekend. We're obviously the Thousand Cup preliminary quarterfinals or quarterfinals? It's the quarterfinals. Actual, actual quarterfinals? Actual quarterfinals. Yeah, again. yeah those four games. Uh, the prelims are over in the Thousand Cup, but the prelims are just about to begin in this yeah, sexy branding. <laughs>
yeah it's going to be uh, it's, it's games every weekend now and it's, it's like you know when you're previewing these weekends you're like well, where, where the hell do we start so yeah Cavan Down Meath Wexford and Limerick Leash are all on Saturday and then Antrim Carlo was the, the only Tottenham Cup quarter final up in Corrigan Park on Sunday at 1 o'clock so yeah some big games to look forward to in both most of them as well you can watch um, of course there'll be updates across the weekend on Off the Ball as well Saturday and Sunday um, depending on who you're following alright 13 minutes past 9 OTBAM live with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back Neon that edition is available now uh, Manchester United's 2023-2024 Premier League season starts on a Monday night oh waiting all weekend watching everybody else get up and running it's against Wolves Manchester Derby is the 28th of October at Old Trafford and then a trip to Anfield on the 16th of December uh, first round of Premier League fixtures uh, Newcastle versus Aston Villa is the big one obviously mm. first versus second as the wow. season progresses right uh, Chelsea versus Liverpool is the um, pick. pick of the pick of the bunch I think that's an opening day game at the bridge at the bridge yeah interesting uh, and that's going to be the I think that's going to be the Sunday game I don't know if they've announced the Sunday game yet but if Man United was on Monday then um, it would look to me like uh, Burnley versus Manchester City the Vincent Vincent Company oh, Derby oh yes Arsenal versus Forest Bournemouth versus West Ham why do we care about these why do we care about these why do they make a big song and dance about the fixtures every team is going to play each other twice one of those games is going to be at home one of those games is going to be away why do we care about it that's a fact yeah it just whets the appetite Jer. it doesn't well it, it allows football fans to plan oh, I'm going to, going to go okay. over for the trip okay. that week that's yeah, important you know, yeah. That, yeah. I, I grant you that 15 minutes past 9 some highlights from the OTB podcast network for you today the new Formula 1 pod with Shane uh, football with Dan McDonald from last night in sweaty Greece and Rugby Daily uh, great stuff from Richie yesterday when he was playing that clip of uh, Razzie doesn't sound like it's my games at all from Razzie it sounds like here I've got an opportunity to have somebody who we might end up needing to use and I'm going to put him in my squad now on the off chance that we do need to uh, use him I'm going to speak with Joe Malloy in a moment about the golf but first it's the cash machine Off the Balls Summer Cash Machine we had a winner on Tuesday, but uh, somebody yesterday missed the opportunity to win the cash machine on Wednesday afternoon, which means we've got a rollover. There's a potentially life-changing amount of cash up for grabs. If you've entered since 5 o'clock on Tuesday, don't worry, you're still in to win, but you must know the new cash machine amount if we call. Obviously, taking part very easy. Every day, we give you an amount, take notice of it, enter, and if it's you that we call at 3 o'clock, tell us the amount, and you join 63 other people who have won the cash machine this year. The summer cash machine has been reloaded. It's €41,661.43 to enter text OTB and only OTB to 57557 if it's you that we call after 3 o'clock on Thursday June 15th that's today answer your phone within 5 rings tell us the prize amount and you win the money so text OTB to 57557 cost is 250 plus your standard message rate to play you've got to be over 18 you're playing across the Go Loud network of stations and full terms are on our website at offtheball.com get your entry in by 3 o'clock on uh, Thursday June 15th Cash Machine will then randomly pick one entry and it could be you that we call answer within 5 rings tell us the prize amount and the cash is yours text OTB to 57557 the number again 41,661 euro and 43 cents back after this Off the Balls Summer Cash Machine Top pocket go! Ahead of this summer's football in Australia. We put on Australia. It's what dreams are made of. We'll be hosting a night of celebration for the Republic of Ireland women's national team in partnership with Sky and it's coming your way on June 28th in the Mansion House in Dublin. What a moment for the Republic of Ireland. We'll be joined by the full squad. I don't know what we've just done. You know, I did believe we could do it. As well as some other great guests as we give the team a night to remember. Emma Bird is in tears. <laughs> I can't believe it. We finally done it. Tune in to all of Off The Ball's channels for a chance to win tickets to this exclusive event. Sky, proud primary partners of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Out believe together and we can go anywhere. They are going to the World Cup Finals. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. 17, 18 minutes past nine this morning. Joe Malloy, good morning to you. Morning, Jer. Morning, Shane. How you doing, fellas? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, you're planning a grueling weekend of late night watching of uh, West Coast uh, Major. <laughs> it's a disaster. Like, it's a disaster. In sporting terms, it's a tragedy. Um, these are just grim. So we're West Coast, US Open, Los Angeles uh, Country Club, and I don't know, maybe 3 a.m. 
oh. give or take. Going to be a very slow golf course as well. It's uh, a little quirky in a certain way, so it'll be slow and uh, it'll be coffee if you're that way inclined. Nobody knows anything about this place because they don't let anybody, no, no plebs allowed. No plebs allowed. Hugh Hefner, the Playboy Mansion uh, by the 13th tee, this is right in the heart of Los Angeles, like a stunning location. Um, billions, I would think, if you were to buy this uh, um, property and turn it into housing. So Hugh Hefner tried for many years to get in, but they didn't love the cut of his jib. They were less um, impressed with fame than the Riviera uh, types down the road. So very exclusive. Uh, hasn't hosted a professional tournament in decades. Hosted the Walker Cup in 2017. And uh, there's been new management there in the last decade or so. And they're um, loosening the grip a touch on the uh, doors and letting the plebs in a little bit more. And I mean, it is stunning. Like it, it, it's, um, it's often a thing we do when there's a major on it. Of course, we don't really know where you, you stick on YouTube and they do a hole by hole guide. And I will often have a look at this with a certain gusto and barely make it to the, past the front nine because it, it becomes a bit repetitive. You know, a golf course is a golf course at a certain point. But this place is uh, so interesting. George Thomas is the designer. He designed Riviera. So he's kind of seen as, um, you know, amongst the doyen of golf designers. Beautiful visually. The clubhouse is kind of stunning. Uh, wide fairways by US Open standards. This isn't single file fairway and lots of rough. The fairways are a bit more generous, but it won't just be um, take a driver off uh, 14 holes without thinking and then play the par threes. There'll be lots of different shots hit off. Uh, the tee boxes, um, nice to be able to work the ball both ways. Um, you'll see lots of traditional Californian terrain like scrubland around the fairways. Apparently it's the 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 last part of central kind of Los Angeles that just isn't covered in um, concrete. So geologists come from all around to see what California looked like a thousand years ago. So it's that kind of place there. Um, par threes, I mean, great variety to them. There's like a 290 yard par three, which is a drive and a wedge for us. And then there's a, you know, like a less than a hundred yard par three. A couple of drivable par fours as well. Uh, the sixth is an amazing hole. Like some players are walking off saying, well, you're a fool if you don't just drive that hole. Uh, others are saying, oh no, you have to lay up and it's a wedge. So it's not like say at Riviera, the famous 10th, where they now know statistically uh, after year and year, year, year upon year, you just have to drive it. That's the way to play that hole. You'll generally come off better. There's a real degree of like golfing IQ here and trying to figure out what is the best way to play this place. We've never seen anyone play it before. And so, you know, that, that brings in kind of a, uh, a quotient to players who really use their minds. And, uh, you know, I, there's a great video of Jordan Spieth and there's like smoke coming out of his ears almost trying to figure out what shot to hit off a tee yesterday. And Justin Thomas is roaring, laughing at him because um, he's overthinking everything. So, so um, uh, the 3 a.m. finish aside, like thumbs up for Los Angeles Country Club. It's it's going to be really good. Saw some of the photos as well, Joe, online of of the Bermuda, Bermuda grass, and there's there seems to be a lot of heavy rough even in and around greens as well. Like it could get pretty nasty for some players. Yeah, this is like the. Um, before every major, someone does a video of someone dropping a ball into rough and going, it's disappeared. That's exactly what I've seen, be, yeah. It's going to be havoc. And then it doesn't seem to play out that way. I, my sense is we won't be talking about this as like, oh, remember that major with all the rough. Mm. I, I, I think it's like, yeah, it, it does catch your eye for sure. And I saw the same videos, but I, I, looking at the course, I don't think that's the defining aspect in the way like it was at winged foot, which is a good thing for me because I, I, I think that takes a lot of skill out of things. But that said, you don't want to be in the rough and the bunkers are very difficult as well. Brooks Kepka saying very soft sand. So usually you hit a fairway bunker and ball might roll back to the middle whereas here it'll stick into that sand and it won't be easy so uh, they're saying that, like you know par is your friend and all that they, they're anticipating maybe four, five, six, seven under as a winning score but again they don't really know okay but like I, I look that brings a little bit of mystery to the whole thing and I, I think it probably freshens things up a bit and makes that good yeah. um, in terms of the contenders and the politics does the politics have any influence on the contenders that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think there's a pep in the step of the live guys. Like Brooks Kepka, who's obviously feeling good about life, having just won the last major, and he's now in five majors, so he's there with, you know, Bryce uh, Seve and Byron Nelson and Peter Thompson. He finished his press conference yesterday uh, by saying, I'll see you all at the Travelers next week, and just got up and walked out. And the golf media were saying, 
Is that a joke? Or is he actually just, did he get an invite to the Travellers? So look, I presume the Live guys are feeling great. Of the contenders, um, when you asked the question, I guess I saw a fairly dejected Rory McIlroy in my mind's eye. He's the one, if anyone's probably feeling a little bit uh, down about the whole situation. In the last 24 hours, the news is that they're going to just pay him off and they're going to pay yeah. off all the, they're going to pay John Ram. So maybe that gets the pep back. It's like, well, maybe. So I, I, I stood as the lone voice in the wilderness. I fought yeah. the good fight and I lost, but then I actually, I won anyway. Yeah. I mean, how are they going to do this? Where do they draw the line? You know, Shane Lowry got an offer. Does how much does he get? Well, maybe you get a percentage of what the offer was if what? you would have taken it. I know. But then you're like, yeah, no, I was talking to a fella. He offered me fifty. Well, live, live, uh, know who who they offer to is the thing. That's well, like, you know, they they have got all the emails. Like, we no, we didn't offer you, buddy. I, I like so, the you know, did for asking. Yes, I know. There are interesting cases though, like Max Homa, very marketable, up and coming guy. We'll be talking about him more in, in years to come. He was approached by Liv, and he said publicly he's talked about this he, he said I don't want to know the figure because it will only tempt me and so he, what, what do we pay him I look they're going to have to do something because I, I can own, apparently the players meeting last week was uh, there was fury heading Jay Monahan's way who's now um, uh, recovering from a medical incident I suspect he's under a lot of pressure Shane Lowry interestingly stood up in that meeting according to Jeff Ogilvy, and at a certain point realised we're getting nowhere here. It's all getting a little OTT. Let's let calm heads prevail and wrap this meeting up. Jeff, Jeff Ogilvy was singing Larry's praises for um, real seasoned pro attitude now. But um, I like the politics. It's just there uh, for sure. And all the players to a man are saying, I have no idea where this is all going. I don't know what golf looks like. You guys know as much as me. That's that's the general um, line from all the players this week. And the evolution of all of the thinking as well. Um, again, in the papers today, there's a suggestion that there will be some minor team element at the end of the season for them, but that essentially Liv will cease to exist sooner rather than later because they don't need to exist anymore. Yeah. So if... If Brooks Kepka is fetching up with the Travellers next week, why would everybody else not start fetching up to the big events? I know. Like that, that's just the end of that. And maybe everybody overthought, how is this all going to work? It's like, well, it's just going to work because they'll all just play again. Maybe, because like this uh, merger, don't call it a merger, but um, I think it, it's, it's not even a binding agreement and it's just like an intention to negotiate and figure stuff out. They haven't figured anything out. Um, so on the one hand, there are a ton of protocol and it has to be done this way it has to be done that way but then as you as you allude to uh four people just sat around ignored all the protocol ignored the board and made this massive decision anyway over cigars so you know if the sponsors of the travelers championship hear that brooks might be interested <laughs> in the pga tour say yeah you're not going to have the biggest name in golf at your tournament of course i mean exactly so and yeah yeah it could happen very quickly and they have a partnership now or they have an understanding of an intention to have a partnership yeah where it's in everybody's interest for the best players to play against each other as much as they can now because it reminds everybody of what they're missing out and kind of wins everybody over and all of a sudden live recedes <clears throat> and they they keep the heritage of the big tournaments but they started this yeah. new thing and saudi arabia gets exactly what they want which was that? Is the way of the world exactly, <clears throat> exactly. So Brooks is going to win this week, then. Yeah, I mean, the only mark against him is with all his five majors, he's always played the week before, and Liv has not afforded him that opportunity mm -hmm. on this occasion. But um, the swag was back when he um, walked in alpha male energy so he's a huge huge contender and sort of has the mentality to go back to back not every player does John Ram is obviously a huge contender won the Masters hasn't done much since but there's always that kind of recuperation period usually and then if, if you're talking like big three then there's Scotty Scheffler who's a very interesting case in that uh, T to green he's putting in all time performances so at the memorial for instance the other week strokes gained tee to green he was 20 shots better than the field which is the second best uh, imagine giving Scotty Scheffler 20 shots I think Vijay Singh managed something better once in the all the years they've done these stats but like second all time performance he was however not second last but last in putting and his putting has been atrocious so He's, I'm kind of interested to see what this guy who's putting in, uh, you know, almost unprecedented ball striking performances, but can't put at the moment is going to do. Um, so they're kind of the big three. And I, at this stage, realistically, you're saying Rory's kind of uh, just not in the form to be part of that conversation. 
Is it hope rather than expectation for, for Shane Lowry, Joe, do you reckon? Or can he actually contend? Uh, a, bit, a bit of both, yeah. Like, he's he has become genuinely like such a great ball striker. Mm. And this golf course will encourage shot makers. Um, and like you'll find yourself in hairy spots and have to show a bit of ingenuity. And I mean, that's Lowry, 100%. The problem, Shane, it's just the putter. It's 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 not going well for him. It hasn't been for a long time. So that's the big concern, almost akin to Scheffler. Uh, with both of those guys, if they get somewhere on the first or second and they roll in a 20-footer and they say, my God, that felt good, then golf is so ephemeral in terms of the form that they just catch fire for four days and then it could get very interesting. So that that's the question mark. And, and it's been a question mark now for several months. So that'd be the worry with Shane, unfortunately. But like, would you be surprised? Absolutely not. If we get any kind of finish like we got at the Canadian Open last weekend, I mean, you'd take that, wouldn't you? 72 footer to win? Yeah. Yeah, 72 footer to win and Adam Hadwin rugby tackled by security guards so it it had everything yeah I don't know I don't suspect you guys are staying up till 3am uh, with uh, I mean stay up all night watching the golf and straight into work is that the, the gig? It's tricky See I'm at a festival huh. this weekend Joe I'm actually off working on this so I could, so I you could, can watch I could it. finish up the, the raving at 2 or 3 in the morning and, and just get the right. last bit of the round perfect Perfect. What a weekend. Yeah. Jerry be in bed. Uh, Matthew, Matt McLean, the amateur, he's 29. Is it, do we expect him to turn professional if things go well? Or is that like, this is just his uh, amazing heyday and he goes back to amateur golf and is like, ah, I played the Masters and I played the US Open? I don't know, actually. I don't know. Um, I don't know too much about him. Um, I guess if you have even a sniff of professionalism, you turn. Um, so I guess that's his plan and he's using up his exemptions now because why wouldn't you? So uh, I would anticipate, yeah, turn pro, yeah. Kepka, Kepka's in the opening round with, with Rory and Matsuyama. Like that's a, that's a pretty interesting yeah. three ball. We start, there's a lot of swagger in that group. Yeah, the US Open, are, the USGA are kind of um, renowned for like theming their groups. There was much um, the big anger a couple of years ago when they had like... There's no other way, you know, a, 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 a large man's group. Um, <laughs> it was very embarrassing for the three guys. Like, it was it was terrible, you know? So I think what they've done here is almost said, let's get the, the alpha of the PGA Tour and the alpha of Liv and stick them together. Uh, so at a glance, it looks a bit juicy. But they're, um, they're pally enough. They played practice rounds together before the Masters. These guys all live in the same neck of the woods in Florida, see each other all the time. So even though one's Liv and one's... Um, PGA Tour they're all winners in life and uh, they're friendly <laughs> uh, so exactly. I, I, I don't think I don't think there's any um, animosity there whatsoever between Rory and, and Kepka so that, that's not a bad group Rory likes a bit of electricity maybe it doesn't hurt yeah alright so for you the winners coming from those big three or is there a random outsider that you think is uh, going to uh, I do look I, 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 you look at Ram and Kepka and it's hard to look past them I like the look of Victor Hovland, who's been in the final round of the Open last year, and the PGA, he was in the final group with Kepka, and he played very well at the US Open when he burst onto the scene, uh, Michael Richards style in 2019, so I like him. As you work your way down the bat betting, I sincerely hope Patrick Cantley doesn't do anything. He is the world's slowest player, <laughs> and like I mean, he, he, I would think he's going to be involved in a five and a half hour round here. Well, on this um, course, like especially. Ah, uh, it's a bad, bad deal. And then you're down into like speed is just not in the form you need him to be in. Morikawa was interesting. Californian um, kid seems to play well in California. Um, but beyond that, like I could make a case for the next 20 as ever in golf without yeah. feeling terribly strongly. So I, I, it's hard to look past Ram and Kepka. Let's see how Sheffer is putting his. Rory is the uh, mystery wrapped in the enigma. And then I, I do sort of look at Hovland and think, yeah, I, I, my life depended on it of, of those outside the initial two or three. I'd, I'd kind of feel like there's a decent chance you'll be hanging around uh, Sunday. But again, let's see what, how they all find this course. It'll be fun. All right, Joe, great stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. All right, fellas. Have a good weekend. You see too. You. That's uh, Joe Malloy giving us his thoughts there on the US Open. A uh, reminder what's coming up on tomorrow's show, uh, Friday, Ronan O'Gara, Nathan Live from Greece, Pat Spillan Jr. and plenty more. We're live every morning with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shaver. Your money back. Neon Light Edition is available now. Uh, here's a piece about the resurgence of bullfighting in Spain from last night's programme. It's Guy Hedgeco talking with Joe. 
Now you're welcome back. So a uh, topic, conversation I'm really looking forward to. I have not talked about bullfighting on the show uh, just yet. So it is a um, quintessential aspect of Spanish tradition and culture. It is also contentious and divisive. It is, um, for something which feels so Spanish and timeless, it's a relatively modern spectacle. So the New York Times uh, wrote about it a while ago and they said it started in the uh, Andalusia region as late as the 18th. Uh, century it took decades to reach a national audience and then it became something of a craze so there were bull rings in Spain all over Spain Mexico France Morocco a uh, cult of celebrity developed around bullfighters the uh, decline you can date it certainly to the 70s where many of these iconic bull rings have shut down in places like Barcelona and Benidorm and uh, Tenerife and they've reopened as shopping centres and cultural centres and even nightclubs. So that's been the trend since about the 70s. But interestingly, it is enjoying a rejuvenation of sorts amongst younger Spanish people. So to uh, tell us more, very happy to bring in Guy Hedgeco, freelance journalist. You will see his work uh, in, amongst other places, the Irish Times guy. Great to have you on. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, I was trying to get a sense of where um, bullfighting is in terms of popularity at the moment in Spain. The best information I could see is that just under 2% of Spaniards attended a bullfight in 2021-2022, uh, that season, according to Culture Ministry statistics. But within that 2%, uh, the uh, biggest group were the 15 to 19-year-olds. Now, every sport in the world wants those 15 to 19 year olds and it turns out uh, bullfighting has them so that's a very interesting development I read a piece of yours post the crash in 08 and you were making the point then that uh, it is an expensive sport to attend it was really suffering on the back of that uh, economic crisis but it seems to be hanging in there is the point yeah, it is. I mean, there are so many figures out there um, that give you a picture of the bullfighting industry at the moment that um, I think you have to be careful when you when you look at them, um, because um, th there certainly is something of a, of a renaissance. If you look at just the sheer number of bullfights or bull related activities that are going on at the moment in Spain since the pandemic, if you look at those figures and, you know, you you really do see something that looks like a, a, a real boom. Um, there were around 20,000 bullfights or bullfight-related activities last year across Spain. I mean, that sounds like a huge number, and I should point out that a relatively small number of those were actually proper professional bullfights. A lot of those are sort of, you know, amateur or, or kind of uh, fiestas that you get in villages where a bull was chased around by local people. But still, there were 20,000 of those um, across the country last year and that is more than there were in 2019 so you know it really has recovered from the pandemic in that sense in terms of the sheer number of events um, and in fact it surpassed pre-pandemic levels in that sense um and you know you point out there that you know the the um, participation of younger people i think it'd be interesting to look at the, the figures in terms of where those younger people are getting involved because the impression i get is that out in those the little villages or some rural areas where you do get those fiestas i think younger people are very much still involved because it's such a big uh, it's, it's just such a big deal out there for um for the younger generations and when you get into the bigger cities I, I live quite near Las Vendas Bullring in Madrid, sort of arguably the, the most famous bullring in the country. And in bullfighting season, when people are pouring out of the bullring at the end of a bullfight, mostly what you tend to see are you know, people, foreigners, uh, tourists and older people. So that has been sort of a big problem that bullfighting has had over the years, that it's some sort of older generations who um, have been clinging on to it and tourists go along for sort of the novelty. But it's been it's been more, much more difficult to get younger people involved. I think if you look at in the, in the cities, I think you'll probably find that younger people are less, um, are, are taking part much less in the cities. But still, you know, the numbers, uh, when you look at the numbers overall, a lot of people would say, you know, that suggests something of a boom. I mentioned it was a contentious uh, issue for fairly obvious reasons and you know it's interesting uh, on a whole in a whole host of 
areas uh, that contentious aspect has been borne out. So the UN Committee on the Rights of Children they urged Spain in 2018, you need to stop children going to bullfights. You need to ba- you shield them from this kind of violence. And so far, Spain has said, thank you very much, UN. We'll do our own thing. You can stay out of it. Uh, equally, there was like a 400 uh, euro subsidy given to young people, um, which is kind of an interesting idea, actually. I mean, uh, other countries should maybe think about that. So a 400 euro voucher in effect subsidy, go and see some culture. And uh, the question as to whether bullfighting is a cultural act or not went all the way to the Supreme Court and the left leaning government was beaten. And so that 400 euro could be uh, spent to heart's content on bullfighting. Uh, so it's, it's playing out in all these kind of areas. What about um, in the coffee shops and pubs and class rooms of Spain. Is this a hotly debated pursuit, Guy? I don't know. I mean, I think it certainly is, you know, in the political arena. I think when you get out, when you're talking to some people in, in the streets, I mean, here in Madrid, for example, I think going back again to this this divide between the urban and the rural, I really, I really think it's important to to underline that on, on this issue, like many issues, that that is a big deal. So I think, you know, people out in the countryside tend to be much more supportive of bullfighting, much more in favor of maintaining bullfighting. They, they see it as a tradition that you know, it, there are some villages that um, so they can trace the tradition of bullfighting or, or bull chasing um, back, you know, decades or even centuries in their particular village. Mm. Um, and, you know, younger people will talk about that and older people as well. You come to Madrid or you go to Barcelona or, you know, big cities, Valencia and so on, in the cities, people really aren't as interested. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, a, an urban uh, pursuit. So in that sense, it's not talked about uh, um, in those sort of big urban hubs. And, and would it be, for instance, say in Madrid, as the tourists and the older generation are streaming out of a bullfight, uh, would they be likely to encounter people protesting animal cruelty, animal rights groups outside? Yes. I mean, you frequently see that now during bullfighting season, which is you know sort of pretty much throughout the summer into the beginning of the autumn, there are um, a lot of um, animal rights demonstrations, protests which take place um, often right outside bull rings. So, you know, you see this sort of what could, you know, almost uh, appear to be conflicts or they, they don't tend to be to turn into physical um, encounters, but they can get quite heated between animal rights protesters and those who are coming out of bullfights. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's sort of become part of um, Spain's culture war, this big divide, mm. um, very broadly speaking, between the left and the right. Um, but it's, it has certainly fed into that. And it's yet another sort of um, divide or schism in Spanish society, um, which is being played out in the political arena and the social arena. Um, you know, the issues of, you know, gender equality, LGBTQ um, issues as well. And animal rights and bullfighting has become another one of those battlefields. Yes, I can imagine so. Uh, to the matadors themselves, I, I, I presume down the decades, uh, celebrities, uh, cult status, celebrated. I mean, I, like, uh, I don't think you can open a Hemingway book or, a, you know, Picasso, all the, you know, artists, I presume, across Spain have, have been very drawn to that primal aspect of uh, bullfighting. And I'm sure, uh, is there is there a, still a big cachet in being a matador? I was uh, reading, they get 100 grand a bullfight. I mean, this, this is Premier League money guy, and they could uh, do 30 or 40 of these a year. So uh, would I be opening the uh, pages of Hello? magazine or, or you know and seeing the the handsome matador dating the supermodel is it that kind of a vibe well there, there, there is an, a certain amount of that still so you open up you know all our magazine the, the spanish version of hello and you will see you know bullfighters or often it's just relatives of bullfighters or the son of or brother of who are kind of famous by association you know who they're dating and so on so Bullf- that, that's you know something which is very unique to Spain. That bullfightings are part of that. Not necessarily a list celebrity, I would say, but certainly the B list. You know, among TV stars and sort of certain sort of pop stars, they're, they're moving in that sort of um, uh, that sort of level. Mm. Um, they are sort of seen as you know kind of um, um, upper class and that that's sort of level of society. But I think to many Spaniards, uh, more for sort of younger and certainly for left-leaning Spaniards. At the same time, they are sort of seen as a bit of a joke, actually. 
you know, they're seen as a very old-fashioned um, conservative. So part of um, an idea of Spain that you were talking there of, you know, of Hemingway and so on going back, you know, over the decades. Yeah. You know, a lot of people see that as a negative thing because they they feel that this is the this is not the image of Spain um, that that people should have. Um, Spain, you know, should be seen as a much more modern country, and bullfighting is. You know, just a classic case of something which is holding back the image of Spain from, mm. from moving into the properly into the 21st century. Uh, if you'll allow me, and sorry, I, I'll, I'll keep this as brief as possible, but I've never been to a uh, bullfight. I had, I had a fair degree, obviously, of what went on, and presumed there was a. a a degree of pageantry and an order to things. Colm Greaves, who uh, wrote recently in the uh, Irish Examiner um, about his experience of attending a bullfight, I think paints a very vivid picture. So this is a very much a, a shortened down version. But so there's the the prelude where a bugle sounds and then a brass band strikes up a march and a parade enters the ring and there's an entourage and there are picadors who are on horseback and various people involved. There's a donkey who eventually is going to cart away the dead bull. And so they enter very theatrically and they bow in very exaggerated ways before the dignitaries. And then they um, go into Act One where the bull explodes into the ring, bucking powerful 500 kilos of looming jeopardy. The matadors tempt him with waved capes and then quickly retreat behind protective barriers when he re returns their attention. That is the only part of the game that the bull wins, and his victory lasts for barely a minute. So then what happens is a mounted horseman awaits the picador. The bull charges the horse, uh, who skillfully avoids the bull, but uh, in doing so, uh, the bull gets a sharp end of a lance into the shoulder. And then we're into Act 2. Sharp barbed harpoons, called banderellas, at least four of them, are driven into the bull's neck, either by the picador on horseback or by the matador on foot. By now the bull is bleeding heavily, fading energy, dripping scarlet, uh, reddening the packed yellow sand beneath them. And then it's Act 3. The bull stands still now in the centre of the ring, tired, focusing only on his one remaining enemy, the matador, who allows the bull to pass close several times but easily dances around him. The spectators thrill no Noisily. The matador struts, the animal tires, his head a little heavier, a little closer to the ground. The final moments for the bull will, uh, that the bull will see are thousands of white handkerchiefs waving in appreciation of the bullfighter's art as mobile phones fa flash like fireflies, hungrily uh, freezing the images of his ebbing, exhausted resistance. The final motion, if the bull feels emotion, will be loathing, loathing for the man before him, strutting dramatically, posing melodramatically, taunting, mocking, as he organises the final scenes in this three-act dance. Uh, man faces beast eye to eye, the crowd silences, the man lunges. And uh, it's very important that the uh, blade is uh, cold steel this time and driven into the uh, aorta of the uh, bull. Got to say, it doesn't read as uh, anything but uh, torture, really, of an animal. You can really understand, on the one hand, why that primal aspect is celebrated and also why it is so contentious and why there are protests and why there is a sense, come on, what are we doing here? Have you attended one? Yes, I mean, I've been to a few. I haven't been to one for quite a long time. Um, I mean, that, that piece you just read there um, is, is extremely evocative and it really does get across how it feels and how it sounds. And I mean, what I do remember from, you know, the first time, the first couple of times that I went to one, I, I was not really... Um, excited at the idea. I was just curious and I went along as a tourist. But actually, it, it is, you, you do find it, you can get kind of caught up in the sort of, in the pageantry and the noise and the trumpets blaring and, and people chanting and so on. Um, and in that context, it, it's almost quite easy to forget about the sort of the, the, the pain of the animal um, and, and what I've I really noticed more I think the more recent times I've been to bullfights and the most in fact the most recent one I went to was um, about a decade ago because it was the last bullfight one of the last bullfights in Catalonia and I was there covering it for work but I really got a sense that the bull itself or the bulls that were, were involved were bewildered you know um, more than anything else they really you know they didn't just didn't understand what was going on. And I think one of the criticisms you hear so much about bullfighting is that 
you know, there's there's really not an equivalence there. The, the, the jeopardy that the the matador is facing is so much lower than the jeopardy that the bull was facing. You know, mm. it, it's a massive surprise if a bullfighter is hurt during a bullfight. There was one death. Um, I think around nine or ten years ago yes. um, in a bullfight in the summer um, I forget the details but there was a huge fuss about it and there was a huge fuss because it was so unusual you know and there were interviews with the widow of the bullfighter um, and it received a huge amount of publicity and inevitably it, it sort of triggered a massive debate um, from both sides and there were people you know animal rights people saying well he deserved to, to die because how many bulls has he killed in cold blood and then there were his defenders of this bullfighter saying he was a great hero mm. um, but you know clearly in terms of jeopardy the, the bull is, is uh, almost certain to die whereas it, it's very unusual if a matador dies yes and not so much a question but just I was interested to read um, well not surprisingly first of all the bulls in question are bred for this very purpose they're called fighting bulls they're selected for combination of aggression and energy and strength and stamina but uh, it's interesting uh, during uh, the breeding of these bulls and, and, and their uh, youth they rarely rarely encounter humans and if so they never encounter them on foot and what's more if a bull for whatever reason is deemed to have fought bravely and, and, and spared in a bullfight uh, it never fights again the logic being same as why they never encounter humans on foot too often uh, the logic being they'll have learned from their first encounter and they could potentially be more dangerous to the matador second time around so you know let's not let this uh, beast learn and, and if they survive which I presume is a rare enough um, uh, situation they ain't fighting a second time because they'll have learned the uh, they might have learned a few tricks which again just underlines your point about just that this game is not not even uh, and it's not enough of an exaggeration to say it's rigged yeah and, and I mean there, there is also criticism uh, there has been criticism of the way that bulls are bred um, you know there, there are you know experts within the bullfighting industry who will, will say that you know the bulls being bred now are much less aggressive, much less likely to hurt a matador or kill a matador than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. And they're being bred deliberately to be more docile. So, you know, there are people who say that, um, you know, despite all those, the, the, you know, these measures that are taken and that in theory, the way they're being bred is the same as, as it was, you know, all those years, going back years and years. Um, the the cards are sort of stacked against them um, because the, the, the breeders are trying to make sure that they're more attractive for bullfights. That is, that they're not going to kill the, the, the matadors. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned it's very much part of, uh, it's just the latest in, in a litany of uh, culture wars in, in Spain. I was uh, reading not surprisingly that for some right-wing youth who very much proudly associate themselves with all the symbols of traditional Spain that attending bullfights has become uh, fashionable so there, there is that political component and that brings us maybe into Catalonia where it was banned a decade ago so talk to us about bullfighting and the Catalan region well, yeah, it was, it was banned in 2012 by the uh, the Catalan Regional Parliament, um, and the the reasoning behind that was that you know the the parties that that approved that ban they said it was it was an animal rights um, driven prohibition. Um, however, it, it was very contentious, not just because bullfighting fans were angry about that, but there was the argument from those who opposed the ban that this was purely uh, driven by politics in the sense of um, territorial politics, the tensions between Catalonia and the rest of Spain, which were already pre running pretty high back then, 2011, 2012. Um, there was a, a claim by Spanish unionists that the banning of bullfighting was being used by Catalan nationalists to try and uh, distance Catalonia from the rest of Spain culturally because yes. bullfighting is such a sort of stereotypically Spanish activity. So it was a very uh, contentious ban anyway. It was actually lifted. The ban was overturned four years later by mm. the Constitutional Court, which said um, that the, the Catalan Parliament couldn't do that. But despite the, the overturning of the ban, um, bullfighting has never returned to Catalonia. There hasn't been um, enough momentum to bring it back to the region. 
Um, so, so Catalonia has not seen a bullfight um, for the last what uh, 11 years, although there are many in the region who would dearly love to see it return. Okay, interesting. Uh, and, and I presume, I mean, listening to your analysis, I presume animal rights being very important and everything, the reality is they did look at, well, what's more uh, Spanish than bullfighting? And let's be honest, we're not going to ban football. So that was the obvious choice. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, the- in, in Catalonia, they have continued to have these other bull-related fiestas called Correbus, right. um, which animal rights uh, activists get very upset about because, for example, they can include you know, attaching fireworks to, the, to the, the horns of bulls. And the bulls are not killed, but you know, animal rights uh, activists say, well, they're being humiliated and taunted and, and essentially tortured. Um, and that's not, and, and even some bullfighters will, will um, criticise those sort of traditions, saying that is pure humiliation. There's no ceremony involved in it. It's just essentially a bunch of sort of people in a village running around with fireworks, taunting an animal. Um, so that has continued, um, and that is very much a sort of Catalan tradition. Yeah. And, you know, it, it remains to this day. Do bullfighters and fans of bullfighting? regarded as a sport or is it seen more like in the world of art well i think more is seen as being more part of the world of art because if you go to the uh any newspaper daily newspaper such as you know el país el mundo they will run bullfighting reviews or articles about bullfighting in the culture pages so it's seen very much as part of, of culture and i suppose that you know that goes all the way back to you know when people like hemingway or you know or you know the spanish poet garcia lorca was friends with bullfighters um and it was seen as you know yet another uh, form of art back then mm. um, and obviously that that has changed now I, I mean I think many people even supporters of it may not argue fully that it's 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 um, you know comparable to cinema or um, or other forms of art mm. but it is always regarded technically speaking as culture rather than sport um, and that there has been quite a lot of debate about whether bullfights should be uh, televised as well live on public TV. Um, what tends to happen is when there's uh, a left-wing government in place, uh, bullfights are not televised live. I'm not sh- exactly sure what the situation is right now. When there's a right-wing government in in office, they're more likely to be broadcast live. Right. Um, after after but, the um, watershed, or could you flick on there at two o'clock? In the no, Sunday? because it, it would be it would be live. So not often they begin at five or six o'clock in the afternoon, okay. and if, so they would be on live then. So there would be no no watershed whatsoever. So children would be able to watch that. Certainly, yes. Right. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of people listening would be saying to like little Johnny or Mary sit down there and watch that. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you go to a, the bullfighting academies and there are, you know, there are children learning to be bullfighters, you know, fewer, I think, than there were, um, you know, a couple of decades ago. Mm. But I mean, I, I remember going to a bullfight again, covering a, um, a sort of village bullfight for work um, in Madrid um, about a decade ago. And I, I spoke to a kid who was, he must have been 12 years old. Um, who was, I mean, he, he, he killed a bull. It was a very small bull. Um, but he was an up and coming sort of young bullfighter. He was one of a group who were uh, involved in it. It was a bullfight for, for children. And this was sort of the kind of final step in their, um, in their learning process, mm-hmm. being in an actual bullfight with quite a big crowd. You know, they weren't in Madrid, but they were in a little village outside Madrid. But um, this was part of the process, you know. Um, and, you know, so, so kids are learning this and kids are, are certainly seeing it on TV. That, that um, is not something which has, um, has been blocked. Mm. I, I must, uh, I must uh, read a review of a bullfight now, Guy. I didn't realize it was in that section of the paper. So, I mean, is it, you know, great costumes, lacked a certain stage presence, this kind of stuff? Well, I mean, if you, it's interesting because if you read um, El País, for example, they have a, you know, a, a critic, they, they have a you know, bullfighting correspondent who basically covers all their bullfights. And he's extremely outspoken in criticizing the state of bullfighting at the moment, even though he's an absolute aficionado. Um, he knows his stuff. Um, so, you know, when there is a good bullfight or what, what he would consider a good bullfight, he will say so and he'll explain 
you know why it was why he feels it was good why a certain bullfighter won an ear that is you know when your bullfighter is deemed to have performed well um, he an ear is cut off the ball and he keeps it he can then keep two ears who performs extremely well and the tail um, that's a sort of the, the ace in the pack if he's deemed to have performed pretty much perfectly so you know a, a correspondent like that will explain why a bullfighter um, has you know is seen as having performed particularly well but by the same token um, you know this guy Antonio Lorca the, the correspondent will mm. um say you know, why a bullfighter really wasn't up to it was was performing extremely badly and a lot of his criticism is aimed at the state of the bulls as well as the bullfighters saying that you know again the bulls um that are being bred are too docile this is the fault of the breeders and um you know many of the bullfighters are, are not matching up either so he in a way is very he's very pessimistic about the state of bullfighting even though he loves it dearly okay uh, final thought then what's your uh, sense if we're uh, to catch up in 20 years where will bullfighting be well I mean there are a number of pressures on it not least of all there's the animal rights issue um, if you look at polling then more than half of Spaniards according to the last polls that I've seen are opposed to bullfighting believe it should be banned um, in one form or another um, and I think that is going to grow I think D despite the sort of you know the, the the youngsters who are interested in it, I think there are so many other youngsters who are um, aware of animal rights and um, opposed to it. I think in that sense, it's facing a squeeze. But I think perhaps the biggest threat to it um, is this business model. You know, it, it doesn't seem to have been well managed. The industry of bullfighting doesn't seem to have been well managed. It was pretty chaotic during the pandemic. You know, many people were wondering if it was actually going to just shut down pretty much forever. It didn't. It has bounced back, but it's relying heavily on subsidies from local governments, such as here in Madrid, um, particularly conservative local governments. Now, if you take those subsidies away, it's really struggling. And it doesn't seem to have enough big stars at the moment, you know, young, big stars who can pull it through. So mm. I think if you come back to it in 20 years' time, I think it's going to be in a pretty poor state if it's still around at all. Guy, I have to say, that was so interesting. Um, I threw every question at you there. The answers were fantastic. So I, I, it, it's like you're a bullfighting expert. I mean, you do cover more than bullfighting, I should stress. So uh, well, you wouldn't know listening to you. <laughs> expert by default, I think. It's not something I, I, I'm conscious of taking an interest in. But in Spain, you can't help but, but follow it, really, um, the state of it, you know, for better or worse, really. Very good. Well, listen, we appreciate your time. Uh, Guy Hedgeco, freelance journalist. You'll see Guy's work in the Irish Times, amongst other places. Thanks so much, Guy. It's an Absolute pleasure. Great to talk to you. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Off the ball.